In the mid-1980s, a philosopher and theologian by the name of Dr. James Kars defined these two types of games, finite games and infinite games. A finite game is defined as known players, fixed rules, and an agreed-upon objective. Football, baseball. There's always a beginning, middle, and an end. And if there is a winner, then necessarily there have to be losers. Then you have infinite games. Infinite games are defined as known and unknown players, which means you don't necessarily know who all the other players are, and new players can join at any time. The rules are changeable, which means every player can play however they want. And the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. We are players in infinite games every day of our lives, whether we know it or not. There's no such thing as uh, winning education. You can come in first for the finite amount of time you're at school, where we agree upon the time frame and the metrics, grades, but nobody wins education, nobody wins healthcare, nobody wins global politics, and there's definitely no such thing as winning business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because in my first business, I struggled to stay afloat. I quit on my business partner, and the thing that kept me motivated, that kept me going, was studying the stories of famous, successful entrepreneurs. And in their stories, it gave me the hope, the drive, the ambition, the thinking that maybe I can do it too, that extra bit of belief. And I still need their stories today, and I'm honored to share them with you here as well. So today, let's get some incredible motivation from the one and only Simon Sinek. Enjoy. But if we listen to the language of so many leaders, it becomes abundantly clear that they don't actually know the game that they're playing in. They talk about being number one, or being the best, or beating their competition. Uh oh, we said yeah. that too. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> but, Oops. Okay. But the question is, the question is, the question is based on what? <laughs> based upon what agreed upon objectives, metrics, and timeframes? Clearly, your competitors, the other players in the game, haven't agreed to your metrics, time frames, uh, or, uh, you know, or uh, uh, objectives. Nobody's agreed what winning looks like, you know, and so this is a problem. Because when we play with a finite mindset in an infinite game, when we play to win in a game that has no finish line, uh, there are some very predictable and consistent outcomes. The big ones are the decline of trust, the decline of cooperation, and actually the decline of innovation. And so there's a great irony in companies that are trying to reinvent themselves and stay ahead of the curve, while simul simultaneously trying to beat their competition and win and be the best, those two are incongruent, right? Um, uh, I'll give you a, an example, a silly example. Um, when Circuit City went bankrupt, mm -hmm. Best Buy didn't win anything, right? It, it didn't win anything. There's nothing, the, the, their number one competitor fell out of the game because they ran out of the will and resources to play, but Best Buy didn't win anything. They had to keep playing. In fact, with the rise of Amazon, the entire rules of how they played the game had to change. And so the reality is, is when you play with an infinite mindset, you play not to beat anyone, but ultimately you play, uh, the only true competitor is yourself, which is how do we make our products better this year than they were last year? How do we make our services better this year than they were last year? How do we make our culture stronger this year than it was last year? And it's a game of constant, constant improvement, but there's no such thing as winning. If we don't have a sense of purpose, then you're doing the thing you're doing just for the sake of doing it, right? Like I'm, I'm making money just for the sake of money. I'm, 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 I'm doing, I'm turning this wrench just for the sake of turning this wrench. And when, when that we, when we do things that contribute to something else, contribute to something bigger, it gives our lives and our work meaning. And when we have a sense of meaning, when we have a sense of purpose, it does many, many things to us. It builds our self confidence. It makes us better decision makers. It makes us better in relationships. And at the end of the day, it makes us enjoy our lives and find fulfillment in my work, in, in our work. Um, and I think so often, um, you know, and, and I think there's a, a lot of, a lot of people don't think about it this way. They don't think about what's the purpose of all of this. Like, what's the reason I'm doing all of this? We usually default to, I got to pay my bills. Now, that's a function, you know, um, because I was told to do it. Uh, because everybody has to work or because I'm just trying to, uh, I want to make this company the biggest or the best to what end, to what, to what value. Um, and so to truly understand purpose, um, I think, like I said, it, it sort of just, it just has positive effects all over the place. What is that optimist mindset means? So I think there's a great misunderstanding of what optimism and what, what an optimist is. Um, you know, I think people think optimism and blind positivity are the same thing. And they're not. Blind positivity, everything's good, everything's fine, everything's good, which a lot of leaders think they have to do. They think they have to be positive all the time 
to keep their team motivated, inspired. And the reality is that actually backfires because when we're going through stress, we actually, and we see our leader always positive, always positive, we think there's something wrong with us. It actually backfires. Optimism is different. Um, optimism is not naive. Optimism is very realistic. Um, optimism is the undying belief that the future is bright. And we can be in a dark tunnel and say, these are hard times. And I do not know how long we will be here. And I do not know how far away that light is, but I know that if we work together, we will come out of this better than we went in. Optimism, again, is about the future, but it is, it is absolutely accepting of difficulty and stress in the current day. There's a great story of two, two lumberjacks where every morning they start chopping wood at the same time, and every day they stop chopping wood at the same time. And every day, one of the lumberjacks disappears for about an hour in the middle of the day, and every day he chops more wood than the other guy. And this goes on for months. And eventually, the one who works all day, he says, I don't understand. Every day we start at the same time. Every day we stop at the same time. Every day you disappear for about an hour in the middle of the day, and every day you chop more wood than me. Where do you go for that hour? And the other lumberjack looks up and goes, oh, I'll go home and sharpen my ax. You know, that, that if, you, if, you, if you take an infinite mindset, it's not about how much you can get done each day. It's how much you can get done over the course of a career or over the course of a lifetime. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you got to take vacations, which means you turn off your email and you turn off your phone and you do not connect to the office. You know, go sharpen your axe. Like you do, you take a Friday afternoon off. You know, we have something called duvet days in, in our company where, uh, um, where it's, you wake up in the morning and you just can't do it. And it's not like asking, you know, it's not like vacation days yeah. where you plan ahead and it's not like sick days, you know, where you're, you're actually sick. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're not sick. You just, you just don't want to do it. Or I'm just not feeling it. Today. You're just not you're, feeling you're, it, and you just you can't yeah. do it. And you and you do it responsibly. You can't leave your team in the lurch. Obviously, sure. you know we you have to exercise um, responsible freedom. But we give people an opportunity instead of lying and pretending that they have a stomach bug um, because they just can't face the day that they can just call up and say I'm I'm taking a duvet day, and everybody goes go go. We got you. You know go. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. I can tell you what I went through, which is what set me on the journey um, to sharing the message of the why and, and uh, helping people find theirs. Um, a why is like a, is like a, it's like a compass direction. It, it tells you where you're going. Um, we can live our lives by accident, which is kind of like getting in a ship and just sailing or getting in a car and just driving. You'll absolutely see some amazing things. You'll stumble an, upon some amazing experiences, but you don't really have a sense of where you're going, any sort of direction. In other words, what's it all for? What the why does is it provides a path, it provides a map or a compass. So you will still have some of those amazing experiences, but now they have value and worth and they're taking you towards something else. Um, It's a journey towards something. Um, When I learned my why, um, I had this tremendous calm come over me, uh, a sense of uh, my confidence grew, um, a sense that my life had more meaning than I thought it had before. And I had now the choice, um, a new way of viewing decisions, a filter, Um, through which to make decisions, which now I would ask myself, does this help um, advance my why or not? Does this help me stay on the path that I'm supposed to be on? Or is this gonna be a random random, uh, adventure? So the why provides focus, direction, meaning, and, and, and confidence. We already talked about great leaders or students of leadership. You know, what, how's, your, how's, your, how's your journey? You know, do you watch the talks, read the books, all the things like that? Um, who's your leadership buddy? Somebody who, who, who's sort of willing to call you out when something goes, goes a little bit awry or they disagree? How'd I do today? Was that okay? You know, to have a, a, an objective um, outsider, having a leadership buddy is really important or a group of folks that you talk to on a regular basis about it. That's huge. I have a group of people that I talk to on a regular basis where we just call each other and talk about this stuff or tell each other things that go right and things that go wrong, the stuff that I've learned just from them telling me stuff, huge. Um, Empathy, practicing that empathy muscle is a big one, right? 
I, I said it multiple times before, which is trying very, very hard to replace judgment with curios curiosity. Catching yourself where you're immediately like, they're an idiot, they screwed up, they got it wrong, right? To, I wonder what else is going on, or I wonder what happened, or let me go on a fact-finding mission before I come to a conclusion, right? Those are things that are, they're, they're, they're simple, but they're hard, but you can do it tomorrow. The other big one is checking in with your folks. Like having one-on-ones and just being like, how are you? Like, tell me what's going on. Like, what's going on in your life? You know, and I know, especially in a paramilitary organization, machismo, guns, you know, all of this kind of stuff, but to, to have conversations that are a little bit raw, a little bit vulnerable, you know, like people have challenges in their lives. They've got kids who are struggling. They've got kids who are struggling through COVID. They've got family who's sick. Like all of this stuff comes to work, you know? And having safe spaces and just checking in with people. One of the best chiefs that I know, every year he does a listening tour of his whole organization. You could just do it for your team. We have hour long one-on-one -on -one conversations just to listen, not solve anything. What can, you know, how's it going? How is, your, how is the job? What can we do better? And he just listens. And it's this hugely cathartic experience, but he gets tremendous amounts of learning about what he can do better and what the organization can do better. And just knowing his people, like the names of their spouses, the name of their kids, things like that make people feel seen and heard. You could do that tomorrow. When we feel safe amongst our own, the natural reaction is trust and cooperation. When we do not feel safe amongst our own, the natural reaction is cynicism, paranoia, and self-interest. So the question is, how do you create a circle of safety? As it turns out, the human body is built the exact same way as any organization. If we want to direct the behavior of people inside our organization, what do we do? We develop all sorts of incentive systems, we give them a target, we give them a goal, we offer some sort of bonus, and what do people do? They work towards the goals that we set. We direct their behavior. It works perfectly effectively. It works the same way with children. We give them gold stars, and we get them to do the things that we want. It works perfectly fine. Inside the human body are certain incentives that work exactly the same way. And if you've ever had a feeling of pride, status, accomplishment, love, trust, friendship, loyalty, all of these feelings that I'll generically call happiness, are basically produced by four chemicals inside our bodies. They are endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. And so, every single feeling that we basically know as happiness is controlled by these four chemicals. And what they're trying to do is incentivize us to get us to repeat behaviors that are in our, that are in our best interest. In other words, to get us to cooperate, to get us to trust. It is our natural disposition to want to trust and cooperate, and we're always looking for it, which is why the sense of belonging is so powerful. We're always seeking out people who are like us. We want to be next to people who are like us. Call your friends you love. Um, the ones who you know that if you called them at three o'clock in the morning, they would answer the phone. And if they called you at three o'clock in the morning, you would be there for them. Do not do this with family. Do not do this with siblings. Do not do this with your spouse. It doesn't work. Those relationships are too close. Do it with the friends you love. And ask them the simple question, why are we friends? And they're gonna look at you like you're crazy. Because the part of the brain that controls feelings and behavior doesn't control language. In other words, it's hard to put into words. Ironically, you stop asking the question why, because the question why is an emotional question and it elicits emotional responses. Like you ask your kids, why are you home late? Shut up, dad. But if you say, what were you doing that you're home late? They'll answer the question, right? So you, you, after your friends say, I don't, why are you asking me this? You switch to what questions? Come on, what is it about me? What specifically is it about me that I know that you would be there for me no matter what? And they're going to hem and haw, and it's going to be very difficult for them, and they're going to struggle. Don't help them. Don't let anybody else help them. You have to let them go through the uncomfortable process, and you have to play devil's advocate. So they'll say things like, I don't know. You're funny. You're smart. I can rely on you. And you say, good. That's the definition of a friend. You have that with all your friends. What specific, specifically is it about me that I know you would be there for me no matter what? And they're going to go through this process of, and you're going to say, good. That's the definition of a close friend. What, you're going to keep keep at them. And eventually they'll give up. Eventually they'll give up and they'll stop describing you and they'll start describing themselves. And this is what my friend said to me. They said, I don't know, Simon. All I know is that I can just sit in a room with you. I don't even have to talk to you. And I feel inspired. And I got goosebumps. In fact, I'm getting them right now. 
right? So what they did is they articulated my value in their lives and I had an emotional response. So you'll get to the point where they'll say something that you will either get goosebumps or you're well up with tears or something will happen. You will have an emotional response. That's the part of the brain, the limbic brain that controls those emotions. You won't get the exact words of your why, but you'll get in the ballpark. And my friends, what you'll find is if you do it with multiple friends, you'll get very similar, if not the exact same answer, because the value you have in their lives is the same. It's you. So that's a fun way to find your why. I think people make, they create a dichotomy, a false dichotomy that they have to either choose service or individual success. Right. That, that those two are somehow mutually exclusive. Um, and that service means uh, living a, a, a life of suffering, um, right. which is nonsense. Right. Um, and, and then you hear these silly, these silly uh, um, sort of uh, uh, projections like, I'm going to do well so that I can do good. So I'm going to put myself first and then eventually I'll do good for others. You know, a, a friend of mine who is a, a philanthropist, so someone came to him for advice on philanthropy. And this was a former CEO of a very large company. And, um, um, and my friend asked him, so what, what are you most proud of in your philanthropy? And he said, well, you know, we started this charity in the inner city where we help kids uh, go on to college. And he said, that's amazing. You know, how many kids have you helped? He said, 15. He says, is that the proudest thing you've done, you know, in your life? He says, yeah, I'm really proud. And my friend said, so let me understand this. You're proud of 15 kids you helped go to college. Meanwhile, you destroyed the lives of the 60,000 people who worked for you, you know? Um, uh, like that's, that's what happens when you, uh, do well so that you can do good. You put yourself at the center of the equation and then eventually you'll try and even the, the scale so you can feel good before you die. Um, right. um, and the, and, and the reality is the opposite is true. Do well, uh, sorry, do good. And you can also do well. Right. Um, but doing good should not be something that we save for our retirement, um, Doing good is something that we can do every day, and 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 it's remarkably easy. I mean, what your neighbor did for you, just by looking out his window, was good. Saying right. hello, asking somebody how are you, and actually caring about the answer, saying please and thank you. You know, I mean, these are very very little things that cost nothing that make other people um, feel like you saw them, that they matter, that they that they exist. Um, and that, that is, that is a, that is all steps we take to, to doing good. And of course it can, it can, it can grow from there. It can scale from there. Why do you think start with why that message, you know, and the talks around it, the, the, the idea as well as the book, why do you think that resonated so deeply? I think it's, it goes back to being a little kid, right? Like huh. you, you tell your kids something you know, whether you're trying to discipline them, you have to do this or teach them a, a lesson or teach them values or explain how the world works, you know, and what's the first question they all ask? Why? Why? <laughs> because, and, and the worst thing you can say is because I said so. Correct. You know? They want explanation. And I don't think that ever goes away. I think for some reason as adults, we just either stop asking the question out loud and just accept that for some reason we have to just do as we're told. Um, and, um, I think that question is a, an, an, it's an inherently human question. We want to know why. We want to know where we come from. We want to know what our roots are. We want to know why the world works. We want to know why the sun comes up and the sun goes down. You know, like we, w these are, these are not new questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and we're, we're as a, as a, as a, as a species, as a, as a, you know, we're constantly searching for, re for explanation. Hmm. And the, the most confounding things are things that seem to lack explanation. Um, then we have debates. We we can't just accept, you know. Um, and so uh, I I think when 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 you so publicly ask the question why about a very difficult thing like why do I do what I do, why do I get out of bed in the morning, and why should anyone care? Right. I think that pulls on the heartstrings of pretty much everyone. A finite game is known players, fixed rules, and an agreed upon objective. Football, baseball. There's always a beginning, middle, and an end. And if there's a winner, necessarily they have to be losers. Um, then you have infinite games. Infinite games are defined as known and unknown players, which means new players can join any time, and you don't necessarily know who all the other players are. The rules are changeable, which means every player can play however they want. 
and the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. Companies come and go, and yet the, the game continues with you or without you, and there's no such thing as winning. Nobody wins business, it doesn't exist. Um, but if you listen to the language of too many leaders, it becomes abundantly clear they don't always know the game they're playing in. They talk about being number one, or being the best, or beating their competition. Based on what? You know, and I love it when executives come to me and say, you know, we are number one. And I always say, for now, you know? <laughs> Uh, and so, and so um, the idea of building a company that can survive every single employee in this room after you've long gone, and that that company remains true to its purpose um, is a very, very powerful thing. A great example is right outside the front door, you know, the Walt Disney Company, um, you know, the, the purpose that Disney founded. And they've, they've gone through, you know, trials and tribulations for sure, um, ins and outs, but for the most part, you know, when they are at their natural best, they are, they hearken back to their founding purpose. Um, and I love that, I love that. Uh, you know, you ask me, is it essential? I mean, depends on what kind of company you want to run. Um, if you want a company that, that can continue to innovate and set, set the course for what business should look like, define what innovation looks like in your industry long before you're all, you know, long after you're all gone, then build that company. But if you want to build a company that just, um, sucks the life out of people who work there and does damage to the, in, you know, to the industry all in the name of, uh, it does damage to the, the, the communities in which we work all in the name of short-term gains, you can build that company too. It'll come at a much steeper cost um, in terms of love, loyalty, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, so. When my career was just getting going uh, and I was a speaker, uh, which by the way was not my chosen career, I, I fell into it, um, uh, there is a, a I forgot the name of the organization. I think it's called the Meeting Planners Association of America, something like that, where basically all the people from all the corporations and conferences who hire the speakers, like that's their job, they have their own conference. And so to get invited to this thing is like, it's like American Idol. Like, yeah. like if you do well, you get a career for the rest of your life because everyone in the room will want to hire you for their conferences for the rest of years. And if you, if you bomb, they all know who you are and you will have no career, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. so like, I see where this is going. I'm like, I've done this a bunch now. I'm, you know, I'm relaxed on stage now. You know, I got this, you know? And like, this is one of those events that makes every speaker nervous. And, uh, and it's in this cavernous place. Ironically, it was like the worst venue. It was like, it, it echoed. So you'd stand on the stage talking, you could hear yourself. Anyway, Ooh. doing my talk, I'm doing Start With Why, this is back in the early days. I got this, you know, done this a million times and don't know what happened, I lost my train of thought. Okay, I, I know this, I've been through this from before. So I went quiet, you usually find my place and then I pick up again, like I know how to do this. I've lost my train of thought before. I went quiet and nothing happened. I, nothing came into my mind. I had nothing. And now I panicked. And as soon as the panic sets in, now, now all rational thought disappears. And now I start sweating and my heart starts pounding and I got nothing. I got nothing. And I look at my pad and I look at the audience and I look at my pad and I look at the audience. And then I turn to them and say, have you ever had that feeling where you forget what you're talking about and everything collapses, your heart's in your stomach, your heart's pounding, you start sweating, your hands get clammy and sheer panic and they're all smiling. I go, I said, I'm having that right now. Oh. I said, I said, and I gotta tell you, it feels fantastic. I said, because I do this so much, sometimes I forget to be present. And I said, right now, I feel completely alive. I said, I feel totally present and totally with this. It's as much as I, as, as crazy it is, this is amazing. I said, okay, I need someone's help. Can somebody please tell me what I was just talking about? Because I do not know what I was talking about. And they all erupted in applause. I got more applause for that than for the actual speech. <laughs> But the point is, the point is, is, is that in every, silver, in every cloud, there is a silver lining. In everything that happens to us, there is goodness. The part of the maturation of your work is, and it's pretty clear, the mission of, you know, 
helping people rather than always, you know, the over, almost the overconsumption of self-help, right? So the framework of your own company, just give me a, a, a second on that and how you're looking to move that needle. Yeah. I, so there's an entire section in the bookshop called self-help, um, but there's no bookshop, there's no section in the bookshop called help others. Um, and I think that's the thing we're missing. You know, I, I think since the 1970s, when the self-help industry began, it it's done very well for itself. Um, uh, uh, and the question is, is it's, it has taught us a skill, but it's, it's also teaching us to, to be preoccupied with ourselves. And I think as social animals, one of the things we've forgotten is we also need to learn to help each other. And if you look at some of the challenges that plague us today, whether it's disengagement at work or loneliness at home or a struggle to find the job we love or finding, find the relationship that we love, you know, uh, all of those things, the antidote to all of those things is another human being. Um, and the, our ability to help somebody else find the thing that they're looking for actually is, uh, actually gives us the thing we're looking for. Uh, and I'm living proof of that. It's when I learned, when I learned the value of service, everything that I wanted to feel, everything that I wanted to achieve started to fall in place only when I learned to, to, to serve others first. The best leaders actually are the best followers, even if they're at the highest levels of, of the organization, they're still in service. Right. It may not be to a person, but to a cause, to a, a cause, mission, an idea, a, a vision, God, uh, something. whatever it is, there's still some sort of something that they're beholden to and they're devoted to and they're in service to. Um, so, so followership is a thing. Mm. Um, and, um, not to belabor the Marine point, but, uh, you know, Marines, when they evaluate their leaders, they're looking good, for good leadership and good followership. So for example, there, when you go through OCS, officer, uh, candidates, uh, school selection, um, uh, when somebody's a, 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 for a task, you know, chosen to be the leader of that group for that task, the, the, the Marines are watching the others as well. So they're looking to see that everybody's contributing ideas and they're looking to see that that leader takes in those ideas, but is decisive. And, and they're looking to see that the, the, the members of the group, if their idea isn't picked, they still give their all to see that the, the, the leader's idea is successful. Mm. And if it fails, give it their all to pick up the pieces and, and see what they can do. As opposed to going, I told you, right. should have gone my way. <laughs> right, right. I was right. Or, or sabotaging because their idea didn't get picked. Wow. So they go all in. The, so so good followership is is as important as good leadership. Mm. That that we we respect that that um, when a decision is made, we will we will give our blood, sweat, and tears to see that the decision our leaders have made will be successful. And if it fails, we will help pick up the pieces because that's the deal. A U.S. Marine told me the first criterion for being a leader is you have to want to be one. Um, and if you look at the way the Marines select their leaders, select their officers, it's a, it's different than than with their enlisted corps. So if you enlist in the Marine Corps, you go to Paris Island in the east or you go to uh, San Diego in the West to, to boot camp and they will make you into a Marine. Yeah. That's what it says. We make Marines. Yeah. And uh, if you change your mind, you're going to be in the Marine Corps whether yeah. you like it or not. Yeah. There is no changing your mind. Yeah. Once you sign on the dotted line, you're in. Yeah. In the officer corps, it's different. If you want to be an officer in the Marine Corps, you go to OCS in Quantico, Virginia. Um, and uh, uh, it's a 10 week training. And uh, you only have to stay in the first four weeks. Uh, for the next six weeks, you can drop out at any time for any reason. Yeah. Um, and the reason is, is because if you don't want to be a leader, they don't want you. Yeah. They give you the choice. Um, you know, leadership to me is like, is, like, is like being a parent. Everybody has the capacity to be a parent. Doesn't mean everybody wants to be a parent and everybody should be a parent. Right. Leadership is the same. Everybody has the capacity. Yeah. Doesn't mean everybody wants it and yeah. doesn't mean everybody should. Yeah. It comes at great personal sacrifice. It means you have to constantly worry about other people, like being a parent. Yeah. Um, you have to uh, love them whether you chose them or not. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, your team, uh, and uh, and there are skills to being a parent. And everyone who's ever had a child starts reading books when they find out yeah. that they're pregnant for the first time. Oh, yeah. You know. Uh, they start asking their friends. They start asking their parents for advice, and it's constant. You know, whether the kid's struggling at school or struggling at home or having a good time. There's it's all the, you know, it's like I, I hate hanging out with my sister and my brother-in-law when they're with their, their other friends who have families because all they talk about is kids. Yeah, right. Um, uh, well, leadership's the same. Yeah. 
Leadership's the same. You know, the, the great leaders that I know are all students of leadership. They're yeah. obsessed. Yeah. They're constantly talking about it. They're reading books about it. They're watching talks about it. They're reading articles about it. They get together. They, it's, it's the topic of conversation. Sure. Um, and so, you know, if you want to learn the skill set, I mean, number one, you have to want to do it. Um, and B, you're going to have to do some work. Yeah. I mean, it takes, it takes effort. Purpose is always idealized, right? Like, as I said before, I imagine a world in which, right? I'm, I know I'm not gonna get there. Like, when Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, like, one day little black children will hold hands on the playground with little white children, right? Like, all of these things, they're all strivings. And the, the, the milestones that we pass make us feel like we're making progress. And that's why metrics are really important, and milestones are really important. And the, the most important thing is context. There's nothing wrong with quarterly numbers or annual numbers. The only question I would ask is, to what end? To what end? Like, you know, I, I was talking to a young entrepreneur last night, and she's looking for investment. And one of her potential investors said, um, how long is it going to take you to hit $100 million revenues? And I said, don't take that person's investment. Show me one article, one. I just need one. Show me one article in HBR, one study, I don't care, that demonstrates that hyper growth or high speed growth is good for, is good for the company on any level. The answer is there are none. The pressure comes from that person trying to achieve their financial goals. So they put pressure on you to make your short term goals, right? And so, um, and so there's nothing wrong with goals as long as we understand the context and the purpose of that goal, right? Um, I like to think of money like fuel, right? And a car is the company, and the purpose is the destination, right? And if money is fuel, it makes the car go. You absolutely have to have money to make the company go. You have to have, you have to, there is no dreaming big if you have no fuel. You can have the most beautiful car in the world, and yet if you've got no fuel, it's pointless. But we don't own a car to buy fuel, right? We don't own, we don't have companies simply for the money. Right? It's the destination. You want to be able to go somewhere. And the, and the passengers are the employees. And they're excited, not about the fuel in the car. How much fuel do we have? No one gets excited by that. We get excited where we're going. We're going to Alaska. Are we near? And, it's, and, the, and that's the analogy. And when there's a roadblock, if you're only driven by, by uh, the metrics, then the way we think about money, the way we think about corporate goals is the same way we think about our goal is to drive 200 miles a day. Our goal is to make X amount of money, right? That's how we think about it. Well, what happens if you drive 150 miles? Is that a problem? What happens if there's a roadblock? Do you know what to do? You start freaking out and panicking because you're gonna miss your numbers. Where purpose-driven companies that know their destinations in the idealized state, they take detours. And to the outside world, it looks like you're going sideways or slowly, but you know you're just going around. And that's how companies actually look. You know, it's circuitous and messy. And purpose helps us keep focused on the very far distant future so we know we're going in the right vector, even if somebody can't tell we're going in the right direction. And so people have to understand the purpose of the goals you're setting and how they're contributing to something. And start talking, like we and our PL, I don't have the word profit on my PL, it doesn't exist. On my PL, it says freedom. I damn well want more freedom this month than I had last month, right? Freedom to say no to things I don't want to do, freedom to give it away, freedom to take care of my people. I want freedom because profit means nothing. So I'm trying to contextualize all of these words that have no inherent, inherent magic to them. So yeah, think of money like fuel and fuel drives your purpose. Be purpose driven and talk about the place you're trying to get to and talk about the world that you imagine and you damn well better make a lot of fuel to get there because it's going to be expensive and it's going to take a long time. The question is, how do we create an environment on, in which our people can work at, at their natural best? And that is the art of leadership. It's creating an environment in, in which relationships can thrive, in which trust can thrive, and we all know what it feels like to be on a trusting team, right? Um, it means that we feel psychologically safe enough to raise our hand and say, um, I made a mistake, or I need help, or I'm having trouble at home and it's affecting my work, or I'm scared, or I don't know what to do, um, without any fear of humiliation or retribution, but rather to say these things with the absolute confidence that someone on our team will rush to support us. Unfortunately, we also all know what it feels like 
not to work on a trusting team, where admitting any of those things could hurt your chances of promotion, could hurt your chances of, it, it, you could be humiliated. Um, and so when we, when we work on teams where, where leadership is creating an environment where, there's, where trust is a, a, at a premium, um, we force our people to come to work and, and lie, hide, and fake, where they're pretending that they've made no mistakes, they're lying, hiding, and faking, and eventually things will crack and things will eventually break. And, and when you talk about reinvention and you talk about innovation and you talk about challenging the status quo or whatever it is, necessarily there's risk and necessarily there are mistakes and necessarily there's stupid ideas. And you have to create an environment in which that's good. The alternative is everybody playing it safe, which is not the way that leads to, to, to vast or significant improvement. So this is, this is absolutely essential if you want to play in the infinite game because ultimately every single person here will leave the organization or die at some point, you know, uh, circle of life, um, and you'll be replaced by new people. And so the opportunity is to create a, a company with vision and teams that can thrive and outlast every single person here. You cannot have innovation or progress without failure. It doesn't exist. Um, uh, and if you truly aren't failing as you're trying to innovate, then you're probably not pushing very hard because you haven't broken anything. You're, taking, you're making very, very safe choices. We could never have put a person on the moon without a bunch of rockets blowing up first. Like, of course. Um, uh, um, I, I, I met a CFO once. I asked him the priorities at the company, and he said, efficiency and innovation. And I laughed and said, well, good luck with that. You know, innovation is inherently inefficient because it requires experimentation. And experimentation requires failure. Um, much is said about fail fast. I actually don't like the term that we, I think we overuse the term failure. Um, you know, and the, the problem with the word failure is it's like the word cancer. It's too broad. Like if you have stage four liver cancer or you have a mild melanoma, those things are both called cancer. But they are clearly not the same thing. And the same thing is when we hear the word failure. Some people think failure means experimentation, but a lot of people think failure means catastrophe. And so when we tell our company, failure is good, fail fast, that literally scares people. We don't want to fail. So I think we need a new word, right? We want to avoid failure. Failure is catastrophic and it should be avoided. But falling, I think we should encourage. You know, when a kid falls off a bicycle, we didn't tell them they failed. We tell them they fell. And what do we tell them? Get back up and try again. So I don't want to tell people they fail. I want to see people they fell. And I want to encourage them to try again and you know, brush off their knees. So I think we should fall and fall often. And I will judge the quality of innovation, not necessarily um, by if you fell, but how quickly you can pick yourself back up and try again. Let's reinforce that point, because I think it's an important one, that fulfillment is a right and not a privilege. And when we go out with our friends for dinner, or well, when we used to be able to do that, um, uh, uh, you know, you sit around and somebody says, I love my job, and everybody goes, oh my God, you're so lucky, like they won something. That, that statement should be the norm, not the exception. We should all get to go to dinner and say, I love my job, and it's the one person who says, I don't. That's that that we can that we can intervene. Um, uh, so yeah, I believe it is a right, and um, we have a responsibility ourselves to to find a a, a place where we want to work with the people that we would work with, rather than just taking the biggest salary. Um, that we have a responsibility to take care of the people around us, and we have a responsibility to speak up and ask our our leaders to work with us and create a place where people want to come to work. Where, we, where there's a safe space for us to take care of each other and feel taken care of. So there's mutual responsibility all around. Um, so when you say, you know, how do we do it? Well, it, it's, it requires constant work. It's like, how do you stay healthy? Well, I can give you a whole list of things you have to do. You have to eat right. You have to uh, nurse your personal relationships. You have to get enough sleep. You have to exercise. You have to meditate. You have to be mindful. You know, there's, a, there's like 30 things. And you can't do all those things well all the time. It's a striving. Um, and, uh, and when one's doing well, sometimes one, one thing falls off. It's a striving, and it's the same. The, the, the pursuit of fulfillment is a striving. You know, I, I think it's, you know, this is why I make the distinction between fulfillment and happiness. You know, to seek happiness is a lot easier because happiness is fleeting. You know, you, you, you get a new job, you're happy. You get a raise, you're happy. You win a new piece of business, you're happy. You're given a gift, you're happy. You know, somebody says something nice to you, you're happy. And that feeling goes away. No, nobody, nobody walks around with a sense of happiness for a job they got four years ago. It's gone. Um, where fulfillment is different. Fulfillment, you can feel fulfilled by your work even if you're not enjoying it today. 
um, you can feel fulfilled by your work even if, you, if you're having a bad, a bad day, you know, or, or one of your colleagues is grumpy. You can still be fulfilled by the work. It's more, it's more, uh, uh, it's, it's more infinite. It's more constant. And so, um, whereas happiness is, you know, the things that lead up to it, it sounds more like an event. Fulfillment is a striving. It's a lifestyle. Um, and you do all these things, like having a just cause, like building trusting teams, and working to be the leader you wish you had. In other words, you see your life as a life of service to those around you, whether you're in a company, whether you're an employee, whether you're a leader, or if you're just a parent, that you see your life in service, you know, to your spouse, uh, your partner, or, or your, uh, and your kids, uh, and indeed, your community. Uh, what makes a community highly functional is that we view uh, that every single person within that community sees their responsibility to serve the community rather than standing around demanding the community does something for them. There's only one characteristic that I'm comfortable saying that all leaders must have to become leaders, and that's courage. Because leadership is hard, and it often requires sacrifice, and the, the, that it will happen, that you will have to put your interests, your comforts, your advantages aside so that others may gain. And that's sometimes really hard. In fact, standing up for others may mean that you might get your head chopped off. You know, a leader sometimes loses their job because they did the right thing, right? That comes with significant risk. The choice to be a leader comes at significant risk. And this is why not everyone chooses to be a leader. Leadership has nothing to do with rank. It has nothing to do with the title you have on your card. Leadership is a choice. That's it. I know many, many people who sit in the senior echelons of a corporation and they are not leaders. They are authorities and they have authority and we do what they say because they have authority over us but we would not follow them. I know many people who sit at the bottom of organizations who have no authority, but they are absolutely leaders. And the reason they are leaders is because they have made a choice. They have chosen to look after the person to the left of them, and they have chosen to look after the person to the right of them. It doesn't always mean they have to sacrifice their interests, but when it really counts, sometimes they choose to sacrifice their interests because it's in the interest of the person to the left and to the right of them. This is what leadership is. There's another guy who does what I do. He writes books, he gives talks, etc. His work is extremely well respected, and, and I admire his work as well. I happen to hate him. <laughs> um, he's, never, he's never done anything mean to me, and we've always had a very cordial relationship when we see each other professionally. I have an arbitrary hatred of him. <laughs> And as a result of my hatred, um, I'm extremely competitive with him. Um, I would log on to Amazon on a regular basis no. and check my book rankings and then immediately check his. And keep in mind, I check no one else's, just the two of us. And if he was ahead, I was angry. And if I was ahead, I was smug. Um, and whenever his name came up in polite conversation, I would seethe underneath. We were invited to speak together at a conference where we would be interviewed together. Um, and I don't mean, like, like literally, we would be on the stage together. And the interviewer thought it would be fun if we introduced each other. Um, um, and so I went first. Uh, and I turned to him and I said, um, you make me really insecure. And I said, all of your strengths are all of my weaknesses and whenever your name comes up, I get really uncomfortable. And he looked at me and he said, funny, I think the same thing about you. <laughs> the reason I was so competitive with him had nothing to do with him, it had everything to do with me. Yeah. Because his weaknesses revealed to me, because his strengths revealed to me my weaknesses, it's more difficult to take a hard look at myself and say, here's all the work you have to do. It's much easier, and dare I say more fun, to, <laughs> to direct all my energies at beating him. Um, that turned out to be an extremely cathartic experience, um, and I learned the value of a worthy rival. And the funny thing is, after that experience, I've never checked mine or his book wrecking since. Um, I applaud his work, celebrate him, want him to do well, because it turns out, working together, we actually are stronger. Um, 
and I think this is the same folly in business, right? I, I like, you know, which is we decide who our competitors are, and then we obsess with beating them. Like ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox were obsessed with beating each other, and all they did was look at Nielsen ratings every morning. And then Netflix came up and didn't, like, who cares? They're all blew them out of the water. water. Because they weren't even looking. They weren't even watching. Because that's the arbitrariness of, if you, I remember back in the early days when I first started my career, I was in the ad business and I was junior dog's buddy to the junior dog's buddy. And um, I was on the um, competitive analysis team. And basically what that meant was we studied the competition and we put together decks to the executives of look what the competition is doing. And... Um, we sometimes would hire outside consultants to run, you know, research for us. If it was too expensive to study seven of them, we'd cut it down to four, which is hilarious if you think about it. So you're making decisions based on four and ignore, anyway, you get my point. So um, I think the value of the other players in your industry, of the other players in the game, is not to beat them, because there's no such thing. As I said before, you know, Best Buy didn't win anything when Circuit City went bankrupt. Um, but it's to recognize and respect them. There are some players who do some or many things better than you. Maybe they have a better leadership, stronger culture, better marketing. Maybe their products are better designed. Who knows what? And instead of trying to beat them, which me could mean you choose underhanded things or just drop your price, you actually say, okay, let's make our product even better. They have revealed our weakness. Let's now work on that. Because the ultimate, the only competitor in an infinite game is yourself. A just cause is something a lot more idealistic. It's a statement of the world that you wish, the, the, the way the world w you wished it worked. The, it's the world that you imagine. Like we imagine a world, as PwC, we imagine a world in which, and then we devote our practice, we devote our energy, we devote our resources to advance towards that cause, and we're gonna bring our clients with us. The work that we do takes us closer to that cause. So I'll give you an example. So my just cause, our organization's just cause. We imagine a world, so you can see there's that forward thinking, which as an aside, which is why we call it vision, is because you have to be able to see it, right? So we imagine a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe wherever they are, and end the day fulfilled by the work that they do. That is our cause, and it is a cause so just that we would be willing to sacrifice in order to advance closer towards that ideal. We will never get there, it is an ideal. Okay. And, and you can look at organizations or leaders that have made profound impact in their industries or in the world, you'll see these just causes, whether it's all men are created equal, Right, it's a just cause, imperfect in, all, in its own way, but you can see a nation striving. Um, I have a dream, literally, imagining that one day little black children will hold hands on the playground with little white children, imperfect in its own, uh, uh, in, in reality, but you can see a, a, a nation striving. Um, when Apple and Steve Jobs used to talk about empowering individuals to stand up to Big Brother, you can see the attraction to the personal computer because it literally gives power to an individual to compete against a corporation. Imperfect, but a striving. And all of these things become striving that become incredibly inspiring for a, for a workforce because they feel like they're con contributing to something bigger than themselves. But when you think about innovation, if you say provide greater value for our clients, and it's not wrong, I have to stress it's not wrong, but, but, but when you say innovate around that, the innovation tends to be more features and benefits. It tends to be tweaking and efficiencies. When you say be the best, I don't even know how you innovate around that, right? You can't say some, to say somebody, you know, make innovate so we're better. But when you say innovate a way to advance this, the ideas can come from anywhere inside the organization and the ideas tend to be a lot bigger. Okay. So it's not that those things are wrong. It's that what I'm, what I'm offering are, what, um, um, a, a clearer path to embracing an infinite mindset, okay. right? It's not that the other doesn't work, it doesn't have value. It just has less value in the yeah. infinite game. What is the existential flexibility, what does it say to us? So existential flexibility is the capacity to make a 180 degree strategic shift in order to better advance your cause. Um, and uh, the, there's a, I call it a capacity, because you need two things. There's, there's two prerequisites before you can even make an existential flex. One is you have to have a just cause. In other mm -hmm. words, you can't change routes if you don't know where you're going. 
Right. right? Fair enough. But then you're just going to always choose the fastest road, but you may not get anywhere. Um, and the other thing is you have to have trusting teams because if, if you're going to make a profound shift in the way the organization functions or what its strategy is, the, the, the metrics are probably going to go down on the short term and you're probably going to increase the level of stress as the organization changes. And so you need people who go, I understand what the cause is. I see why we're doing this. And, and I'm, and we're going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm a part of this. And they, and the, and the team is willing to go through the shared hardship in order to do the right thing for the good of the future. Um, if you don't have the just cause and you don't have the trusting teams, no amount of vision from uh, leadership will, uh, that, that existential flex will probably fail. Mm. Um, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that reveal, and I think, unfortunately, you're right. I think the church as, a, as, an, as an industry, if we can be so base about it, sure. but the church as an industry um, uh, uh, unfortunately looks a lot like a lot of other old fashioned industries. So why is it that Apple computers, a computer company disrupted the music industry by inventing, uh, by, by perfecting the iPod, you know, right. uh, right. iTunes, iTunes is really the thing that changed. Yeah. It, right. So why didn't the music industry invent that? How is it that Netflix, a little startup that came out of nowhere, um, dominates television and movies Mm-hmm. Blockbuster doesn't exist anymore. They're, they're, they're gone. Why didn't the television and movie industry invent Netflix? But they're now copying Netflix and playing catch up. You know, uh, 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 it's, it, it, the, the disruption comes from organizations usually outside of your, your purview. Um, right. And you see it all over the place. Which, uh, and I think the, the, the church as an industry looks a lot like the music industry, the film industry, the music, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the television industries, uh, which is, this is the way we've always done it. This is how we got big. This is how we got successful. This is how we spread our message. This is how we know, this is what I know how to do because this is what I've been doing for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And so either I'm afraid to change because I only know how to do this or uh, this made me successful and yet I cannot accept what got me here won't get me there. And I also, am, you know, the world around me is changing. Technology is changing. Politics are changing. Culture is changing. And I can't do what I used to do. Like Sears can't keep selling, sending out catalogs. <laughs> it's not the world we live in anymore. They were the most right. innovative company in the world when that was a thing. And so the question is, how do you adapt for the world that we live in? When we talk about safe, we're talking about psychologically That's safe. right. Yeah. Um, uh, and you can be psychologically safe and still trip over a cord. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so it's a, it's a great story. It's, um, I, uh, I had a business trip to um, Las Vegas a bunch of years ago, and the, the client was very generous and put me up at the Four Seasons. Um, which is a lovely hotel, and the reason it's lovely is not because of the fancy beds. Any hotel can buy a fancy bed. It's because of the people who work there, that when you roam the halls um, and somebody says hello, you get the distinct feeling that they wanted to say hello, not that they were told to say hello. Um, you know, we're highly attuned social animals. We can tell the difference. I mean, it's your idea of being the Nordstrom's. is like people can tell the difference whether they're forced to give good service or they want to give good service. Um, anyway, they happen to have a coffee bar uh, at the Four Seasons in Las Vegas. And uh, one afternoon, I went and bought myself a cup of coffee. And the barista working that day was a kid named Noah. Noah was funny and engaging and charming. And I stood there for far too long just to buy a cup of coffee. Um, and so, as is my nature, I asked Noah, do you like your job? And without skipping a beat, Noah said, I love my job. Now, in my line of work, that's significant, because like is rational, right? I like the people, I like the challenge, I get paid well, I like my job. Love is emotional, it's a higher order connection. Like, do you love your wife? I like her a lot, right? <laughs> it's, it's different, right. it's not the same, right? So Noah said, I love my job, so immediately my ears perk up. This kid has an emotional connection to his job. So I followed up and I said, can you tell me specifically what the Four Seasons is doing, that you would say to me, you love your job. And without skipping a beat, Noah said, um, throughout the day, managers will walk past me and uh, ask me if there's anything that I need to do my job better, anything they can do for me. Not just my manager, any manager. And then he said, I also work at Caesar's Palace. And there, the managers walk around and just catch us when we're doing things wrong. There, they're just trying to drive performance. 
He says, there, I just keep my head below the radar. I just want to get through the day and collect my paycheck. And then he said something magical. He said, only at the Four Seasons do I feel I can be myself. So think about that for a second. This is the exact same human being, right, in two different jobs, and yet our experience of him will be profoundly different, not because of him, but because of the leadership environment in which he works. In one experience, it'll be amazing. In one, it'll be terrible, right? That's it. Um, and I think so often, I hear this all the time, leaders ask, you know, how do I get the most out of my people? Well, people aren't a towel. You don't wring them out. Right? How do I get the most out of them? It's, it's a flawed question when it comes to leadership. The question is, is, how do I create an environment in which my people can work at their natural best? And the Four Seasons has figured that out. Right. Right? It's by giving him agency. It's by giving him control to, to do the job that he wants to do the way he wants to do it and checking in to make sure that leadership isn't there to do his job for him or to overly control, but to offer guidelines, but also offer support. And the same goes in any profession. You can take a cop in one agency who will be high performing, a valuable member of the team, a valuable member of the community because of the culture. You can change the agency they work for and they can be a terrible member of the team because of the leadership environment in which they work. It's really easy to be honest. Just tell the truth. <laughs> and if you tell the truth on a regular basis, we will say you have integrity. That's all it means. These are really basic concepts. So for example, if somebody calls and a secretary picks up the phone and says, Dave's on the phone, and you say, tell him I'm not here. You've just sanctioned lying inside your organization. That's what you've done. You have said that when it suits you, even if these lies are small, you may tell lies. That was dishonest. I went to visit Quantico Marine Base, where the Marine Corps chooses, selects their officers. And on the day I was there, True story. I was waiting uh, in a conference room for the colonel in charge of OCS to come and give us a briefing on, 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 on the base about, about OCS, about this, the, the selection process. And he arrived late. Marines don't ever arrive late. And he showed up late. He came in and apologized. He said, I'm sorry, we've had an incident with one of our Marines. So I go, what happened? You know? <laughs> he said, well, we're considering throwing him out of OCS, which means throwing him out of the Marine Corps. Like, and I'm thinking, what law did he break? What did he do? So I said, what did he do? And the colonel said, um, he fell asleep on watch. And I said, that's it? <laughs> he fell asleep on watch in the woods of Virginia. <laughs> you know? I'm like, you guys are tough. He said, and then he explained. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, when we asked him about it, he denied it. When we asked him about it again, he denied it again. And only when we gave him irrefutable proof did he say, quote, I want to take responsibility for my actions. The problem we have, he said, is we believe you take responsibility for your actions at the time you perform your actions, not at the time you get caught. Mm. We have another Marine who fell asleep on watch. He admitted it. He got punished. We have no problem with him. And he went on to explain. He says, you have to understand, I cannot put this Marine in a leadership position where they're responsible for the lives of other Marines because if they are in a combat situation and his Marines doubt for one second that the words coming out of his mouth are anything but the truth, if they believe for one second that the words he is speaking are only to make himself look better or cover his own ass, trust will break down in the whole group and people will die. Now, we are not in life and death situations but the way our minds interpret information that is given to us is in terms of life and death. This is why we don't trust politicians. They tell us the things we want to hear. We don't prima facie disagree with anything we've been told, but we know that they don't believe the things that they're saying. And so we as human beings, we're very, very smart, and this is always ingrained in us, we always make sure just to keep a safe distance from anybody who we don't believe is honest, because if we were to find ourselves in a life and death situation with them, you know what, I'm gonna, if I had to gamble, I'm gonna say, won't go with them. When someone is honest, they're willing to tell us good news, they're willing to tell us bad news, they're willing to be upfront with them. Even if it's news that we don't wanna hear, even if it's not in our interest, we're okay with it. We actually trust them. Hey, listen, I. I gotta be honest with you. 
your performance has been really bad these days. I love this, we always talk to give sandwiches. Give them the good news before you get to the bad news, right? So give them something general and generic that they don't believe anyway. Hey, you're really smart. <laughs> and on this one project that you did that you really completely, like it's really specific when they give us the negative, right? In other words, we didn't believe the positive in the first place. We knew they were just biding their time to get to the negative. Honesty. We keep referring to others in our space as competitors. But the problem with the idea of a competitor is a competitor is someone we set out to beat, right? And so it's setting up the wrong mindset. Rather, we want to have rivals, worthy rivals, rivals who are worthy of comparison. And their strengths reveal to us our weaknesses. And by learning our weaknesses, we learn where we can improve. Because remember, the infinite game ultimately is a game of constant improvement. There is no such thing as best, there is only better. That's all there ever is. But if you don't know your blind spots and you don't know where you're weak, how can you improve? That is the value of the other players in your industry. That is the value of the other people on your own team. You can have a worthy rival that you work with. We've all worked with somebody that we hate, <laughs> that everybody else likes, and they got a promotion and we were pissed off, right? The odds are really high that they have some talent or ability that is revealing to us a weakness that we have, and it's so much easier to hate them than to take a hard look at ourselves in the mirror and then work on whatever we see, right? You don't have to like or agree with your worthy rivals, but you have to be grateful for their existence, and we have to work on the things that it reveals. You have to have worthy rivals, and you get to pick them. Talk about competition a little bit, because my God, we're, we're hyper-focused on beating people, on being right, on, on competition. I'm afraid of it. I need to work harder. Like, un, uh, talk about that a little bit, how we can shift that culture. So my, my, my life and my work has been very much influenced by a philosopher named Dr. James Karst, who in the mid-1980s uh, defined these two types of games, finite games and infinite games. Um, a finite game is defined as known players, fixed rules, and an agreed upon objective, football, baseball. Um, there's, if there's a winner, necessarily there have to be losers. Um, and there's always a beginning and middle and end uh, to a finite game. Uh, then you have infinite games. Infinite games are defined as known and unknown players, which means you don't necessarily know who all the other players are, and new players can join at any time. Um, uh, the rules are changeable, which means every player can play however they want. Uh, and the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. So we're players in infinite games every day of our lives, whether we know it or not. You know, you, you can't win education. You can come in first for the finite amount of time you're at school where we agree upon the time frames, the school year, and the metrics, grades. But we don't, nobody wins education, nobody wins learning, nobody wins healthcare, nobody wins global politics, and nobody wins business. But when you hear the language of so many people, they talk about being number one, being the best, and beating their competition. Based on what? Based upon what agreed upon objectives, metrics, or time frames? And this is a problem. Because when we play with a finite mindset in an infinite game, and we play to win, in a game that has no finish line, there are some very predictable and consistent outcomes. The big ones are the decline of trust, the decline of cooperation, the decline of innovation. And when people become obsessed with beating their competitors in a game where there is actually no winner, right? You, you, there's no winning career. You can get a promotion, sure, but there's no winning career. And there's no winning in business. Um, and so beating your competition is actually based on what? Based on revenues, profit? Based on what? One year, five years, 10 years, the lifespan of the company? Like wh what? what? This, it's, it's all nonsense. It's all made up. And so we spend so much time reacting to what another player has done rather than focusing on how we can improve. And so one of the things that I've learned is to completely eliminate this idea of having competitors, which is I have no competitors in my space, none. There are other players who, who do what I do. And some of those players do some of the things that I do better than me. And those players are my worthy rivals. And it is better to respect and study your worthy rivals because their strengths reveal to you your weaknesses. Um, and if you can have your weaknesses revealed to you, that means you can work on your weaknesses. Because ultimately, as individuals or as organizations, we're in a state of constant improvement. That's all we're trying to do is be better today than we were yesterday, 
be better tomorrow than we were today. That's all this game is, whether it's your life, your relationships, your business, whatever it is, it's a game of constant improvement. And so to obsess about beating your competition actually takes us away from constant improvement because it might make us do something uh, short term or it might make us do something expedient because it gives us a short term leg up or use cheaper ingredients or trick somebody or, you know, because it can drive revenues. And all that does is weaken our own organization. That's all it does. That's all it does. And so uh, I don't think of competitors at all. I think of worthy rivals. And by the way, worthy rivals can change. You know, I get to pick who they are and I get to pick the reasons that they're my worthy rivals. And I'm in a state of constant improvement thanks to them. And sometimes it's something small and sometimes it's something big. Um, but I'm grateful to all those who do similar things to me because it makes me a better player. We have to have trusting teams. I was on a business trip in Las Vegas and they put me up at the Four Seasons, beautiful hotel. And one of the reasons it's a beautiful hotel is not simply because of the fancy bed, any hotel can buy a fancy bed, it's because of the people who work there. That when they say hello to you, you get the distinct sense that they wanted to say hello, not that they were told to say hello. We're highly attuned social animals, we can tell the difference. They happen to have a coffee bar in the lobby and so one afternoon, I went to buy myself a cup of coffee, and the barista working that day was a young man named Noah. Noah was funny, he was engaging. I enjoyed buying a cup of coffee from him. I stood there for far too long buying a cup of coffee just because I enjoyed talking to Noah. So as is my nature, I asked Noah, do you like your job? And without skipping a beat, Noah says to me, I love my job. Now. In my line of business, that's significant. Like is rational. I like the people, I like the challenge, I get paid well, I like my job. Love is emotional. It demonstrates an emotional connection to whatever we're doing. Do you love your wife? I like her a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a different standard, right? Noah said, I love my job. So immediately, I'm interested. So I follow up. I said to Noah, tell me specifically, what the Four Seasons is doing, that you would say to me, you love your job. And again, without skipping a beat, Noah said that throughout the day, managers will walk past him and ask him how he's doing, ask him if there's anything that he needs to do his job better. Not just his manager, any manager. And then he said, I also work for a different hotel, and there, the managers walk past me and catch me if I'm doing something wrong. There, they're always overbearing and trying to make sure that I make my numbers. He says, there, I just like to get through the day, keep my head below the radar, and just collect my paycheck. He said, only at the Four Seasons do I feel I can be myself. This is the exact same human being, and yet the level of performance will be completely different, not because of him, but because of the leadership environment in which he's working. I get this question all the time. Simon, how do we get the most out of our people? They're not a towel that we wring them to see how much we can get out of them. The question is flawed. The correct question is, what environment do I have to create? What do I have to do to help my people work at their natural best? That's called leadership. And when we can create a trusting team, teams in which people feel trusted and trusting, what will happen is it makes them feel safe enough to raise their hand and say, I made a mistake, or I'm having trouble at home and it's affecting my work, or you've promoted me to a position that I don't know what I'm doing and I need more training, or I need help, or I'm scared. If we do not have trusting teams, what we have is a group of people who show up to, to work every single day, lying, hiding, and faking. They hide all of the mistakes for fear of getting in trouble. They won't admit that they don't know what they're doing for fear that they'll be humiliated. They're certainly not gonna say that they're scared or that they need help for fear that it will somehow reduce their value inside the organization. And eventually, things will compound and break. You can't incentivize results, like you can't do that. You can only incentivize the behavior that achieve a certain result. Um, and if it's only about the short term, then guess what? You're gonna drive a behavior that drives short term. And so in your case, what are the behaviors that you're recognizing and rewarding? And so if people are getting bonused only for hitting numbers, 
and they're not getting bonus for how they do business, then you're going to incentivize a certain behavior. So I'll give you an example. Um, so young in my career, I worked at an ad agency, and I was the junior dog's buddy to the junior dog's buddy. And um, it was traditional for a big new business pitch that the senior folks would run the pitch. Um, well, it happened to be around Christmas time, and all the senior folks went on vacation. And so me and one other junior person who were left behind because we didn't go on vacation were told to prepare the war room, which basically means take a conference room and fill it up with all the research. Well, that took a few hours, right? But we still had a week. And so she and I decided to write the whole pitch. We went through all the research, and we came up with a strategy, and we wrote the pitch. All the senior leaders came back, we presented our work, and they actually used our strategy in this new business pitch. And we lost the pitch, we didn't win. And I got a huge promotion. <laughs> my boss actually moved me up two levels inside the company. Because he wasn't rewarding my performance, he was awarding and rewarding my initiative. By, by, by giving me a promotion for taking the risk to do the extra work, guess what I did after that? Took more risks and did more work, even if it meant it, it didn't, winning or losing didn't become the primary factor for me. It was the initiative that, became, but that wasn't because of me and my, and my innate anything. That's because that's the behavior my boss wanted from me. And so I think what happens when we get big is we, be, we do become too obsessed with the result and we don't consider the behavior. There are some brilliant people making big decisions who may have missed the number or may have missed the goal, but we gave them nothing which sends a subconscious message to the rest of the company, which is, if you hit your numbers, you'll do well here. If you don't hit your numbers, we don't care how you do it, yeah. as long as, you know. So you get the point. So I think, you, I think it, it happens, big companies to, need to go back and reevaluate how they recognize and reward. Um, uh, and what, if, you want, if you want risk taking, then recognize the people taking risks, even when they fail. So you say, I, I've met this person that I really like. How do I build trust? Well, you, you don't tell them all your secrets on the first day, right? Um, we all know that you have to be vulnerable, but, but there is, there is a, there's a timing, you know, and it's a dance. And it's, and it's giving somebody a little extra um, uh, responsibility and seeing how they do. And if they screw up, instead of yelling at them, be like, all right, try again. You know, that we treat mistakes as learning opportunities rather than, you know, and a mistake is only when you keep repeating the mm -hmm. same error and you haven't learned anything. Um, um, where uh, we practice empathy. You, you build trust with empathy as well. So... Um, uh, empathy uh, in business looks like this. Um, here's a traditional scenario. Um, uh, somebody walks, you know, picks up the phone or walks into their office when we, had, when we did that um, and says, um, you know, your numbers are down for the third quarter in a row. Um, we've had this conversation before and if you don't pick up your numbers in the fourth quarter, I don't know what's going to happen, right? That's pretty normal. Here's empathy injected into that scenario. Hey, your numbers are down for the third quarter in a row. We've had this conversation before. Um, are you okay? I'm worried about you. What's going on? No. Right? Where it's about the person, not the performance. And so, when again, it goes back to that listening, and you, you are not listening until somebody else feels heard. Those things, you know, seeing someone as human, understanding that we all have stresses and strains and egos and insecurities, and we bring all of that to work. And though we still have to be uh, emotionally professional, you know, you can't sit in a meeting like this because you're having a bad day, that's emotionally unprofessional. Um, though we still have to be emotionally professional, um, we're still human beings. Yeah. Um, and a good leader uh, recognizes that. And by the way, somebody on a team recognizes that too. You don't have to be a position of authority to be a good leader. You know, because those who may be higher in rank than us are also filled with insecurity and fear and stress and strain and ego and, and all that. Right? And it's okay to go up the chain of command and say, hey, are you okay? You know, you were really hard on us in that meeting today. Instead of labeling them an asshole, be like, are you, yeah. are you okay? You know? And, and by the way, and that's the dance. It's like any relationship. You know, it's not expected for one person in an interpersonal relationship to to do all the listening, it, it's a dance, and it goes backwards and forwards, and you, you, know, you, 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 you meet empathy with empathy, and you meet listening with listening. Let's be crystal clear what a trusting team is. We've all been on one in the past, maybe, and I hope you're on one right now. Um, we've all been on trusting teams where we have psychological safety to say out loud, I made a mistake, mm -hmm. or I need help, or I don't know, or I've got some stuff at home and I'm struggling and it's affecting my work product. Um, and I need help, without any fear of humiliation, retribution, or that'll affect your promotability. 
that's what being on a trusting team is, and that's what we have to build for the people who work for us. Not being on a trusting team, we've also all been there, unfortunately, where we're afraid to say, I made a mistake. We would never say, I don't know something or don't understand something. We would never ask for help because it's, we're either gonna get humiliated publicly or we're gonna affect our promotability. Um, and the opportunity to build trusting teams is what leadership is all about. Um, that's, that's where the, the strength of culture comes from. So, uh, so yeah, it's, 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 it's essential to building any kind of business, short term or long term. Um, but definitely, definitely a long-term company, for sure. And all the stuff you talk about, challenging and pushing boundaries, means if you're pushing boundaries and you're thinking big, you're gonna fall a lot. It happens. There's no such thing as innovation without experimentation, and experimentation inherently requires failure. And I think a lot of companies that are too finite-minded, they fear failure. They fear, well, let me, let me restate. I actually don't like the word failure. You, know, you, hear, uh, you hear it a lot, which is, you know, uh, we have a fail-fast culture, you know? Mm -hmm. I think the problem with the word failure is it's like the word cancer, which is there's a huge difference between stage four liver cancer and melanoma and a mild melanoma, but they're both called cancer. That's the problem. And there are failures which are minor and overcomable, and there are failures that are catastrophic, but the problem is they're both called failure. I like the word falling. Failure we should work very hard to avoid, but falling we should encourage because you can get back up. I know of one large gaming company, and I love this, um, that they, they don't have parties when they hit their goals, they have parties when they fail. They have, they have parties when a game completely is a complete blowout because they're trying to acculturize being comfortable mm -hmm. with missing a goal or, or, or complete abject failure. And they have a party and they have their own champagne, which it has a label on it, um, their own label, I think it's called, uh, le they're called lessons. Mm -hmm. And on the back of the champagne bottle after the party, they actually write the lessons they learned from the failure. And so it's a comfortable, it's very comfortable, it's a company that's very comfortable with failing, which means they try again very easily and they're super innovative. Um, so creating a culture where, where falling is, is part of the game, right. I think is wonderful. It has to be celebrated, I love it. Passion is not an input, passion is an output. Uh, passion, um, you know, we're all passionate, we're just not all passionate for the same things. And we will feel what we call passion when we are involved in something that is deeply personal to us, that is helping us advance some higher purpose or cause, then when we go to work, what we, f what we experience is passion. But if you make us do something that we feel no personal connection to, that is not us helping advance any kind of bigger ideal, then what we feel is stress. Now, passionate people work many hours, they don't come home, they miss their families, they take business trips, they, they don't sleep, and yet it feels worth it. People who are stressed go on business trips, they miss their families, they work long hours, they don't sleep, but it doesn't feel worth it. Passion is an output, not an input. Like stress is an output, not an input. So you, don't, you can't do what you're passionate about. You find something you believe in and what you will experience is passion. So then it begs the question, how do I find what I believe in, right? There's a, I think society, especially our society, and especially for a younger generation, puts overwhelming pressure on us to have a vision. What's your vision? Or find your bliss, or all of these, they're all the same thing, right? And the problem is we're not all visionaries. It's unfair. It's an unfair standard. That's like telling everybody be to, to be creative, but we're not all creative. Or everybody be good at math, but we're not all good at math. We're not all visionaries. Only a small percentage of our population are actually visionary. You don't have to have a vision. You have to find a vision, right? If you hear Martin Luther King say, I have a dream that one day little black children will hold hands on the playground with little white children, you go, that's what I want. You choose to follow Dr. King. When you hear the words of visionaries, and if they appeal to you on some visceral level, they give you goosebumps, they make you excited, they make you wanna sacrifice, be a part of it, stand in line to hear them, pay money, whatever it is, follow that, make that your vision. Take it and say, that's my vision too. You can adopt someone else's vision and make it your own. That's what we call a following, is we have taken the visionary's vision and we have chosen to follow that vision ourselves. We are followers, that's a good thing. There's no difference between the visionary and the follower. We both see ourselves in service to something bigger than ourselves. Whether you are the originator of that idea or not is irrelevant. What it does is fuel passion. What it does is fuel conviction. So we don't have to have a vision, but we do have to find one. 
And so read books, watch TED Talks, read articles, be in life. Watch videos, you know, go out, seek, find, listen, listen to leaders, corporate, political, whoever, and when something resonates with you, even if you don't know why, that then you can adopt, and you can take it upon yourself to use your own talents, your own gifts, to help advance whatever that cause is, right? So I have a cause. I have a crystal clear vision of the world I want to live in. I imagine a world in which the vast majority of people wake up every single morning inspired, feel safe at work, and return home fulfilled at the end of the day. The gift that I have committed to help advance that cause is the ability to put some of these ideas into words that other people can relate to. You know, when you do a jigsaw puzzle, the first thing you do is lean the box against the wall, right? We all have a piece of the puzzle to help build this vision. My piece of the puzzle is I'm the guy that points at the box. But I'm not the guy who builds the business. Because there are other people who are better at that, the entrepreneurs and the business leaders. I want them to embrace the same picture on the box. The people who work for companies who say, I want to work for a company that does that, that's their piece. The one who's a, gi a gifted natural leader, who cares. We all have at least one friend who, for whatever reason, love us and care us even when we're horrible people. That, that for some reason they still believe in us and they see the good in us. That's their piece of the puzzle. And so we have to commit our gifts. The reason they call them gifts is because they're forgiving. That's what gifts are. They're forgiving away. If you have a gift, it's not something you take, it's something you give. So I think we have to find a vision and commit our gifts to help advance that vision. And the great leaders are the ones that can put that vision into words so clear that we can then recite that vision as if it were our own. I think very often companies can risk becoming reactive to things that happen in the marketplace, which may, so here's a great example, right? Let's use a real life example. BlackBerry was a really fantastic company who built a really fantastic product with a really clear sense of vision, which is we make strong, secure, extremely reliable products. And if you remember, if you ever had a BlackBerry, you could throw that thing across the room, drop it on the street, and it just didn't break. It just kept working. It was the most reliable product on the marketplace. You could type on the full QWERTY keyboard without even looking down. You could send a whole email. And governments and big businesses loved it because it was really secure and really reliable. Then the iPhone showed up. And the iPhone was the new shiny object. And BlackBerry, instead of sticking to their core and their beliefs, became distracted by the shiny popularity of the iPhone, which is a completely different animal serving a completely different audience. And they started trying to copy iPhone. So they started putting apps on their, on their Blackberries, which what did it do? Made it slow and sluggish. Um, then they started coming out with flat screens. You're not going to make a better iPhone than an iPhone. Um, and they de basically destroyed their company because they completely went off the reservation and, and abandoned their fantastic cause. There could be two marketplaces where you have the shiny object of the iPhone that we use in our personal lives and our companies prefer that we use a, a BlackBerry because it's reliable, it's safe, and it's, and it's really, really strong. Um, and we could have had two dominant players for two dominant reasons, like a PC and a Mac. Two dominant players for two dominant reasons, for, for two different reasons. But they didn't. They got distracted. And I can imagine that their, that their business people were saying, you know, business is moving at light speed. We have to react. Um, or we can work to advance our cause in a different way and not become distracted. And that's part of the hard thing, which is, are we stuck in our old ways or are we actually sticking to our, sticking to our long-term vision? That's, that's part of the, the difficulty of business, to know the difference. When COVID first showed up, I loved listening to the commentaries. The number of people who said, in these uncertain times, and I would always giggle to myself because all times are uncertain. There's never been a time in history that wasn't uncertain. Um, all that happened was something that we didn't expect happened suddenly that reminded us, you know, that things are uncertain. Every stock market crash, nobody knew that it was going to happen tomorrow. It's always uncertain. And this is where a finite mindset, an infinite mindset rather, this is where an infinite mindset can be very valuable. Because players who play with a finite mindset fear uncertainty and work hard to avoid surprise, which is why they like short timeframes. We like the quarter 
or most of the year. Don't talk to me about three years or five years. That, that freaks me out. And I like everything to go according to plan and be very predictable. And so when something unexpected happens, panic is their normal reaction, right? When you learn, when we learn to embrace an infinite mindset, we actually see opportunity in surprise and we embrace uncertainty. So when something unexpected happens, it's still stressful, but when something unexpected happens, we go, oh, I wonder what we can do with this. This is exciting. Hey, team, come here. Let's talk about how do we work in, these, in, these, uh, in, in this environment. And I saw it happen during COVID. It was so easy to see which companies were playing with a finite mindset and which were playing with an infinite mindset because the finite-minded companies panicked and went into survival mode and everything was about themselves. How are we gonna survive? How are we gonna make money, right? Whereas the ones with the infinite mindset went, okay, opportunity here. What if we were to start our company from scratch today? How would we do things? Like what if we didn't exist yesterday and today was the first day of work? How would we do things? Still very stressful, but very exciting. And instead of putting themselves at the center, they were very more preoccupied with the customer. People still want what we have. How do we get it to them? As opposed to how can we make money? And so I could tell the difference immediately. And so the more we learn to embrace an infinite mindset, uncertainty becomes a joy, becomes an opportunity for creativity. And so it's, it, that's one of the huge benefits. Is there practical things we can do to create a culture of seeking out that feedback and creating a safe space? Well, the simple answer is, of course, um, the, there's no such thing as a, a single silver bullet. It's a combination of things. It's like, what's the one thing I can do to happy, have a happy relationship? Well, I, I, can't, I can tell you a important thing, but I can't tell mm. you the important thing. So it's the same. Um, and everybody's a little different, you know, and each culture is a little different. So there's, there's not even a set list I can give, but there's some things that people can choose from. You know, one thing is one of the ways we create space is how we react. Right? If someone gives you feedback and you deny it, well, that's a problem. If somebody gives you hard feedback and you thank them for it, it's a very different mm. environment it creates. So I, I, I'll give you two uh, examples, one a lesson, the other one a practical example that someone can use. So I had the opportunity to visit the Army Rangers, uh, Ranger School in particular, and I, where they make, they, they make Army Rangers. And one of the uh, troubles they had a, a bunch of years ago was they had these folks that they called Spotlight Rangers, which was, they were really good at their job. Like they were brilliant at all the tasks that were set to them, strong. Their, the teachers, the instructors loved them. They stood out, they were great, they were motivated. But as soon as the spotlight was turned off, when the instructor wasn't there and they were back at barracks, they were assholes. And the only person who, the only people who knew were their, were their friends and colleagues because the spotlight was turned off. And so the army rangers implemented a system of peer review in order to identify spotlight rangers. And in now, by the way, they started this 40 years ago, which I find incredibly advanced. Um, but to advance through ranger school, you need to pass three tests. You need your instructor to say, yep, you're ready to go to the next level. You need to physically actually perform all the tasks required of you. And you need to pass your peer review. Um, and if you fail any one of those three, you don't make it to the next level. Interesting. And so that becomes a, a, an, an equally weighted component of advancement in the Army Rangers, which is what kind of team player are you? Which I love. So uh, we implemented a system of 360 review um, which was sort of a bit of an amalgamation of things we'd taken from other groups and made our own. Where what we, what, the way it works is um, you take the, the group of people you have regular interaction with and you um, fill out uh, your top three weaknesses or the places you believe you need to grow the most with a specific example for each. So top three specific weaknesses or, or, or places you need to grow the most. And then top three specific strengths or the places you believe, three examples of the places you believe you've grown the most. They have to be specific. Not like, oh, I'm a much better timekeeper now. No, that you've got to give some specific examples. They're collated and distributed amongst the team. And then you come together as a group and you take turns 
reading them. So first you read your own weaknesses. And then the group has the opportunity to add to that list. And here's the best part. We give a little speech before the whole exercise starts that the people who are going to give you this feedback really don't want to. It's really uncomfortable for them. It's going to be, uh, they, they would just rather not do this exercise at all. But they're going to do it because they want to see you and help you grow. And so what they're giving you is a gift. And so you have to receive it as a gift, which means you say thank you. You don't have to agree with it. If you don't agree with it, say thank you and just dismiss it. It's fine. But if it has an emotional impact, if it makes you angry or frustrated, it's probably true. <laughs> right? And we go around the room and somebody tell, they, every, people can add to this list of these weaknesses. In any way, they, there's no format. They can do it in any way they want. And you sit there and you look them in the eye and you genuinely say, thank you. You're not allowed to say a word except thank you. Then you do your strengths and you read your threat strengths and anyone can add to the list. And just as you discovered you have blind spots you didn't know you have, you discover that you have strengths that you didn't know you had, that you're having a positive impact in the lives of others that you didn't know you were. And it's a magical experience. There's usually tears at some point because it's powerful and it's a safe environment. What does it mean to live an infinite life? Clearly, our lives are finite. We're born, we die. But life is infinite. We come, we go, and the game continues with us or without us which means every single one of us has the choice of how we choose to live our lives, how we choose to lead our organizations. We can lead with a finite mindset, try and make more money than our friends, try and get ahead faster than everybody else, try and achieve more power than anybody else, and when we die, we take none of it with us. But the choice to live an infinite life means we choose to build an organization that will be better off because we work there, we will leave it in better shape than we found it, it means to be the kind of friend and leader to others that they will be better because we were in their lives. It means we will literally live on beyond ourselves. It's just a choice whether we choose to live with an infinite mindset or a finite mindset. Does this walk me through? Because I'm actually very curious about you before you. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm really kind of curious about. So, you didn't, you were like disgruntled with your career a little bit, right? I wouldn't say disgruntled. I'd, I'd, didn't I, love it. I'd fallen out of love. Yeah. Okay. I was, I had no passion for my career. Okay. And this was a chosen career. Like I started my own business in a category in a profession that I thought I wanted to spend the rest of my life in. Consulting. Mar marketing. Oh, okay. I thought that was You know, good. and, uh, and to wake up one morning with a superficially good life. I owned my own business. We had amazing clients. We did really good work. Our clients liked us and didn't want to do it anymore. Right. It's kind of distressing because as I, as I said, where we started, you know, so many of us intertwine our identities with our work. And if I don't like my work, then who am I? Right. And so I went through that, um, which uh, was incredibly unfun. Um, and it was the discovery of this, of this little idea that I called the golden circle you know, where we all know what we do. Some of us know how we do it, but very few of us know why we do what we do. And I realized I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. Um, and it was, uh, it was that crisis that was designed to do nothing more than help me find my own passion to get back my, my mojo um, that put me in a path that was um, unexpected. Um, uh, my, my entire career is an accident, you know? It's amazing. Um, I'm, I am living proof that, uh, that you can, that you don't have to have a plan. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. And it worked out for you, right? <laughs> you have to have a vision, you have to have a vector, you have to have a direction, but you definitely don't need to know the individual steps. Having a sense of purpose, cause, or belief for our work is what gives our work and frankly our lives meaning. Um, you know, when we die, nobody wants the, the last balance in their checking account written on their tombstone, you know? Uh, nobody wants the last title on their last business card on their tombstone. We don't, that's not how we want to be remembered. We want to be remembered for the kind of person we were in the lives of others, you know, devoted mother, loving father, you know, these kinds of things. Um, and, and we want to know that our work uh, uh, had an impact in something bigger than ourselves. Uh, it's a very normal human thing. Um, unfortunately, 
uh, a lot of people don't start to think about thing, those things until later in their lives. And I've yeah. heard this. I, I usually hear this from senior executives, believe it or not, where they say, you know, I've had great success and I've done all these things, but, but I, don't want my, I don't want my life to end on this chapter. I, I would feel like I've done something wrong, you know? And they want to make sure that, they're, that they do something powerful and impactful in the lives of others, that that's how they want to close the book on their lives. What I love about this young generation is they're starting to think about those kinds of things now. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's not unique to a young generation. Everybody wants their work to matter and have meaning. I think our young generation is just more vocal about it, which is wonderful. I always sort of reject the concept of, of blunt honesty. You know, um, you can be honest without being an ass. Um, uh, you know, do I look fat in these jeans? I like the other jeans better. That's an honest assessment without making somebody feel bad, uh, for example. Um, and we also have to get good at evaluating someone's personality. Some people are more sensitive than others. And so a good leader is able to adapt their style and how they uh, offer information so that um, sometimes they have to be a little more polite to some and they can be a little more blunt with another because their personalities can take it. Um, uh, what we want people to do is hear the feedback, hear the input. Um, uh, and it's based on how they receive it, not how we like to give it. We have to be the adaptable ones um, as, as, as leaders. Um, but he, he's absolutely right that good leadership starts with care. And I hear this all the time, unfortunately, which is, you know, as a leader, I didn't get to, uh, I didn't get to choose my team, so why should I care about them or why, why should I trust them? You know, they're not, I didn't choose them. Well, you didn't get to choose your children. You love them. Um, and this is one of the, 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 the risks of leadership. You know, leaders have to take the risk to care. They have to take the risk to trust first. I've never in my life heard a great leader say, prove to me why I should trust you to their team. It's the opposite. A, ri- a leader takes the risk to trust. And it's the team who says, prove to us why we should trust you. That's the correct hierarchy. Um, uh, so, so, yes, you, you, don't, you do have to care. You want to see, you want to see your people as human beings first. Um, you know, they are not the problem. They may have a problem and inject a little empathy into the, into the organization. This is what, what reflects care. Uh, so for example, I'll give you one, one example. Um, uh, so here's a pretty normal scenario. Somebody walks into an office and says, you know, your numbers are down for the third quarter in a row. We've had this conversation before. If you don't pick up your numbers in the fourth quarter, I don't know what's going to happen. Empathy, uh, changes that you walk into their office and you say, your numbers are down for the third quarter in a row. We've had this conversation before. Are you okay? What's going on? I'm worried about you. That's empathetic. That's the expression of care, that we recognize that someone may have a problem, but they are not the problem. I'll give you a personal example. The person who, who sold me this property uh, was the seller's agent. Oh, okay. Right? He was charming and nice and wonderful and lovely and helpful and all the things that I would expect. And I warmed up to him and he was apparently helping me and then I remember distinctly at the closing he sat there with no personality all of his charm had left um, all of his friendliness had gone he barely engaged with me he just wanted to be there to collect his check so he could get out of there and I realized it was all fake it was all for show it was all to butter me up so that I would simply sign on the dotted line and as a result I will never work with him again as a buyer or a seller um, I'll never list with him ever and I probably will never work with that company again because I realized they just saw me as a number. They never saw me as a person in the first place. Um, he was an old white guy. I mean, that should tell you a little bit of something as well. That, that, that's sort of maybe how he was raised in the industry. Um, and by the way, the mortgage broker was no different. You know, uh, he was charming and wonderful and lovely and helped me get a great rate, et cetera, et cetera. And then I remember after I closed, he called me and said, congratulations. And I said, oh, thank you. That's so nice of you. And he called me just to congratulate me on closing on my house. And then the first thing he said to me was, and if you know anybody who's looking for a mortgage, I'd really appreciate the recommendation. He never called me to congratulate me. He called me because he wanted the referral. Like, give it a breath. You know, like, call me and congratulate me, and a week later, ask me for the referral. And see, let me tell you what sucks about that. Can I say that? What sucks about that totally is that's that one person yeah. colored your entire well, no, no, opinion. But, he, and, but this is finite versus infinite. Okay. He, he could only see the transaction. He could only see get business, get more business. Get business, get more business. What he didn't understand is he's dealing with a human being, and the more that there's a relationship, I will gladly recommend him. I will gladly introduce you to yeah. my guy 
right? Um, now I'm completely agnostic because if you're going to treat me like a transaction, I'm going to treat you like a transaction. If you're going to treat me like a transaction, I'm going to squeeze you to get more money out of you. I want a lower rate. I'm going to squeeze the agents. But if you treat me like a human being, I'll gladly pay a higher rate because I want to work with you. And that's what infinite-minded players understand better, okay. which is you don't have to be the cheapest. You don't have to have the lowest rate or the lowest price if you have a great relationship. What does it mean to live an infinite life? Clearly, our lives are finite. We're born, we die, we come, we go. But life is infinite. The game of life will continue with us or without us. Which means every single one of us has a choice. We don't get to choose the nature of the game. Life is infinite. We don't even get to choose if we want to play in the game or not. Once you're born, you're in it. We get one choice. Do you want to play with a finite mindset or do you want to play with an infinite mindset? To play with a finite mindset means waking up every day and saying, I'm going to be the best, I'm going to be better than everybody else. I'm going to accumulate more power, more responsibility, more money, whatever it is, whatever, you, whatever your metric is, I'm going, to, I'm going to get more than anybody else, me. And when you die, you take none of it with you. Or we can choose to live our lives with an infinite mindset, which means I'm going to leave this world, this school, in better shape than I found it. It means I'm going to devote my life to see that those around me rise. And we know that we're living with an infinite mindset because our obsession is seeing that we have an impact on the lives of the people around us. We've all had teachers, and some of you are those teachers, where 20 or 30 years from now, I can go to one of your students and say, you're a remarkable human being. You've accomplished so much in your life. How did you become the person you are today? And they will tell me your name. We all remember the teacher who believed in us. We all remember the teacher who had our backs. We all remember the teacher who saw something in us that nobody else saw. We've forgotten all the others, but we remember those couple. And that's what it means to live with an infinite mindset. It means we devert ourselves to that mindset for everyone in our lives, that other teachers will say that about us, other principals will say that about us, other students will say that about us, our friends will say that about us. I am who I am today because of you, and I will commit to live the same life that you taught me how to live. And you will literally live on your own, your own lifestyle, your own lifetime. That when you're gone, others will carry your work for you. This is what it means to live an infinite life, and it is just a choice. To me, um, art is like a gift. You know, if you have capacity, if you have talent, if you have grit and hard work and you want to produce, gifts are supposed to be given. So what's the point of giving a gift if no one gets it, right? Um, what's the point of producing a symphony if no one gets to hear it? Um, so I think reception is important to, to give the art point, meaning, as opposed to pointless, you know? Otherwise, you're just decorating your home. Now, we could have a debate whether I'm receiving it myself, right? Um, so we, we could definitely debate that. But, but I, 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 uh, I, think, it, it, I think, and maybe this is just the romantic in me, um, it has to be enjoyed. And, and maybe one, one, one person is fine. Maybe if you hang it in your own home and it's just for you, that's fine too. But, uh, but I think art has to be enjoyed. Otherwise, what's the point, you know? Um, um, otherwise, it's just therapy, you know? I'm just painting for therapy. And we all do things like that, you know? Um, art, art has to have another human being involved. Uh, to me, art is about a relationship, right? You, you, you can't call yourself a, a romantic or somebody who chooses to, to love another if, if nobody ever feels your love. <laughs> You know, uh, it's, I, think, I think art is, um, is, a, is, is, is it's a type of language, right? Um, I know uh, people who are the world's worst communicators when it comes to their emotions when you, ask, when you have a conversation with them. I've dated some of them. Um, <laughs> but given the opportunity to write, it's magical. And the feelings pour out on the page in, in an eloquence like I've never seen. And as everyone here knows, great art in some way, shape, or form is always personal or semi-autobiographical, right? It's too hard to write pure fiction. You know, we, in, we, we, we put ourselves in it because it gives it an, a, a sense of reality in it, and it's what makes us passionate for the subject that we're tackling. Um, I know dancers who, you know, you meet them and they're like this, but as soon as they start dancing, you realize there's, it's all there. 
So, so art is language, and if no one hears you, you know, does a tree, if a tree falls in the woods, you know, if no one hears what you're saying, is it worth saying anything? They're just thoughts. So what's the point of writing a play that never gets shown? It's just a thought, you know? It's just an intention. So yeah, no, I think it must be shared. It's, it's, the, it's, it's one of the ways in which people communicate. What if our why scares us, um, and, and we fear that people won't see it? Do we abandon it, or do we just go for it? Okay, so there's two thoughts there that are worth unpacking. Okay, if other people don't see it, okay, that's, let's, let's deal with that first, because I think that's a little, that's a little simpler. Um, if other people don't see it, then the question is, are we showing it, right? And so many of us, all, all of us, especially at various times, we're all lying, hiding, and faking at various points, right? Um, somebody asks a question, you know, that makes us uncomfortable in a public forum. Sometimes we agree to something. We say yes, even though it's not true, because we just don't want to embarrass ourselves. We're very often inauthentic. Plus, we live in an Instagram, Facebook, TikTokable world. We're all presenting ourselves and curating ourselves as how we want to be. So we're really good at, at showing people the kind of person we want to be. It's kind of ironic as well, if you think about relationships. Um, you know, we present ourselves as, the, as our best selves, but it's only really when our vulnerabilities and insecurities are revealed can love exist. Um, that's that magical authenticity. So I would argue that if, if the world doesn't see who you are, you know, are there ways that you can share it with the world in a way that is inspiring um, to them and, and authentic to you? Um, uh, how you show up, you know, uh, sometimes the clothes you wear, sometimes it's, it's silly stuff. Um, you know, I, I, I always, I would often wear bright, brightly colored ties in college. I know a little, a little nerdy, but, um, one, because it sort of was a reflection of my independence. I didn't dress like everyone else, but I, it, it also made people smile. I would catch them seeing my, my tie and it would make them smile. And, and I liked that. Um, and so there are lots of little things we can do personally, um, to bring our why to life. Now, what I'm really interested in is what you said, Andrea, when you said, what if our why scares us? Now, if it's actually scary because it's dangerous or difficult, um, then maybe it's not fully our why. If it scares us, but because we are afraid that others will judge us for what it is, like this is truly who I am, this is why I wake up out of bed every morning, you know, then, then I think you have to go for it. Now, the question is, do you have to jump in the deep end? I think that's a question of your own risk tolerance. I think there's nothing wrong with wading into the water starting in the shallow end. Um, I mean, think about it. Look what I do for a living. Inspire people that do the things that inspire them. Like how corny and cheesy is that, right? Like I'm fully aware of that. When I first started talking about it, people were like, well, that's cheesy. I'm like, I know, I know. And so I, I, but I still would do it. And was it a jumping in the deep end? No, I would dip my toe and I would test things out you know, um, and I would try things out and I'd see how it was received. And sometimes it went well and sometimes it didn't go well. I was learning to swim with my why is basically was my why floaties. I was wearing why floaties. That's what I was doing. Um, so yeah, I think if, it, if it's, if you, if it feels right, cause that's the test of a why, you know, does it feel right? Does it feel like who I am? Does it give you chills or goosebumps or does it make you well up when you think about it? Does it excite you? Uh, then it's probably accurate, and yeah, then you're gonna have to uh, at least get in the shallow end. You dip your foot in and try try using it in certain places. And as you get more comfortable, you'll learn to swim. So my favorite definition of culture is culture equals values plus behavior. Um, and so you have to have a clear set of values first. And innovation, honesty, you know, these aren't values. Those are the things we write on the wall, but those are nouns. And if, it, if it's values plus behavior, it's things we want people to do. Everybody thinks they're honest, yet everybody tells lies. So yeah. the value isn't be honest, the value or honesty, the value is tell the truth. The value isn't innovation. You, you can't walk into someone's office and say, a little more innovation today, please, right? You know, uh, doesn't like nobody, you can't innovate, you can't execute on innovation. It's not an instruction. Um, but you can tell people, look at the problem from a different angle. Like that's something you can do. So to, to and, and by the way, your values are not aspirational. They're not a bunch of executives sitting at an offsite, cutting pictures out of magazines and saying, this is the company we want to be. Your values are who you are when you are at your natural best. Your culture already exists, but you're not necessarily always operating at your natural best. And that's as true for companies as it is, as it in, as it is for individuals. And so to uncover your values, is not aspirational, it's a process of discovery, and then you can write down this, I've never seen more than five, weirdly, 
don't understand the biology, but when you start getting more than five, they start to overlap enough that you could probably eliminate one of them, which I think is interesting. Um, but there's, there's, there's at least, uh, as mo uh, sorry, there's uh, at most five values, three to five, um, that are who you are when you operate at your natural best. And now the question is, is can you develop recognition, rewards, incentives to promote those values? Are you talking about those values? Are you hiring to those values? Are you firing people who may be high performers but refuse to live to those values? Because then what you're doing is reinforcing to the rest of the company that the values matter more than anything else, um, which is really important. Because if we talk about values, but then all we do is promote toxic team members who are high performers, and we've all had this happen, where sometimes even management knows. They're like, you know, that person is a real asshole. They're like, I know, but their numbers are so good, right? Um, and then we let them be. And so that sends a message to the rest of the company that we're talking about these values, but we don't actually believe it. Um, and so we don't necessarily have to fire that person, but we do have to coach that person. I don't think you can motivate the unmotivated. I, I don't think you could motivate people. People either are motivated or unmotivated. I think you can inspire people. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, it, you can motivate people with sticks and carrots, you know, offer them bounty or threaten punishment, and you'll get behavior that you want. Is there loyalty? Is there love? Absolutely not. Um, usually, when people are unmotivated, it's not necessarily them. It might be the situation they're in. Um, maybe they don't belong in the culture. Um, maybe they feel unseen or unheard. Maybe they're scared. Maybe they're unprepared. So we, we have to, you know, when somebody's unmotivated, let's not label them as unmotivated first. What are the 20 other things that it could also be? Let's start there. Now, are there some people in the world who are unmotiv unmotivated? Absolutely. You hired them which means you bear some responsibility if it's, if it's time to transition them to help them find another place where they're going to be a better fit. We can't yell at them and call them stupid and unmotivated and push them out the door. We have to bear some of the responsibility. We hired them. And if we made a mistake and hired somebody who's a bad cultural fit, then we have to take care of them and help them transition to somewhere where they're going to be a better fit. Um, I think that um, you know, if we only focus on motivating people, and that's a factor, then um, you're only going to get very finite thinking. An excessive amount of motivating things, like hit this number, get this bonus, uh, you'll get a motivated employee pool that doesn't care about each other, might stab each other in the back, and eventually will take a better job somewhere else. We have to inspire people. We have to give them that sense of cause and vision that their work is worth more. Uh, we have to make them feel like they matter and feel like they're seen and heard and understood. And what ends up happening is those people are not only more motivated and inspired, but if they're offered a better higher paying job somewhere else, they turn it down because it's not just about the bonuses and the money. It's because they would rather be here with these wonderful people. So ethical fading is a, f a really amazing and fascinating social phenomenon. Uh, basically what it is, is when a group of people make unethical decisions, believing that they ha are still consistent with their own ethical framework. In other words, they don't think they've done anything unethical, right? Extreme examples of this would be things like um, a pharmaceutical company raising the price of an essential uh, uh, a drug uh, 500%, 800%, 1,000%, 5,000%. 5, and though it may not be illegal, it's highly, highly unethical. And, and yet they don't think they've done anything wrong. Um, uh, that's an extreme example, but we see ethical fading happen all across companies all the time, um, where we do things that we know are good for us, where we might lie to our, our customers or our clients, for example, or we might lie to each other to get ourselves ahead. You know, this is all, these are all demonstrations of ethical fading. Um, uh, the way in which ethical fading happens, um, as you said, one of the ways is just a ridiculous, unbalanced amount of pressure on short term, which forces us to think about ourselves or, or uh, only think about uh, that, that short term goal. Um, and then we can rationalize. Well, everyone's doing it. It's what the company wants me to do. How else am I going to get ahead? I have to put food on the table. It's the system. It's, you know, like we can rationalize the behavior. Um, the, also the slippery slope. We do something a little bit once, it worked. We do it a little more, it works. We do it a little more, it works. We do it a little, and before you know it, you have full-blown ethical fading. 
Um, and so the way you combat ethical fading, and, and, and like I said, I gave you an extreme example of the pharmaceuticals, but we see low-level ethical fading across a lot of companies, unfortunately. Um, and the way you combat it is, uh, is one, uh, uh, good leadership, uh, where that kind of thing is not tolerated. Um, so for example, it's, it's totally normal for people to have unethical ideas, um, but the question is when, when do they get caught? So in an unhealthy company, that, that unethical idea is implemented until social pressure or the law intervenes, or there's a scandal, right? And then we say, oh, we're terribly sorry, we, you know, we're a very good company after you got caught. In a, in, a, in, a, in a properly ethical company, somebody may raise the idea in a meeting, and everybody in the meeting will go, that's funny, but we would never do that here. That's, that's not us, that's a little bit unethical, and we get, it gets shut down immediately. Um, uh, and, and again, that's good leadership because it's the leaders who are promoting people who are ethical, who are highlighting ethical behavior and acting in a way that sets the tone and they're not putting undue pressure on people to break the rules in order to make the numbers. Um, you know, a lot of leaders, unfortunately, when confronted with toxicity or unethical behavior, they'll shrug their shoulders and say, I know, but the numbers are so good and they allow it to happen. And so one of the primary ways in which you beat ethical fading, quite frankly, is, is, is good leadership. But the others are just cause, you know, trusting teams. All of these things contribute to, to operating in a highly ethical way. So in the mid-1980s, a philosopher and theologian by the name of Dr. James Kars articulated these two types of games, finite games and infinite games. A finite game is defined as known players, fixed rules, and an agreed-upon objective, football, baseball. Um, if there's a winner, necessarily there have to be losers, and there's always a beginning, middle, and an end, right? Then you have infinite games. Infinite games are defined as known and unknown players, which means you don't necessarily know who all the players are, and new players can join whenever they want. Um, uh, the rules are changeable, which means every player can play however they want, and the objective is to perpetuate the game, to stay in the game as long as possible. Turns out we're players in infinite games every day of our lives. Right? There's no such thing as um, winning global politics. There's no such thing as winning marriage. You can't be number one in your marriage. You can be number two, but you can't be number one. Right? Um, uh, there's no such thing as winning education. Nobody wins learning. You can come in first for the finite amount of time you're at school where we agree upon the time frame and the, uh, uh, and the metrics, grades, but nobody wins education and nobody wins business. Like when Circuit City went bankrupt, Best Buy didn't win anything, right? But if you listen to the language of so many leaders... Half the room doesn't know what Circuit City is. I know, it's sort of, I realize that. <laughs> it used to be a company right. that competed with Best Buy. Same right. thing. Big box store went in, bought a VCR. You don't know what a VCR is. Right. Um, what I love about this, these definitions is that when we listen to the language of so many leaders, it becomes abundantly clear that they don't know the game they're playing in. The number of leaders who talk about being number one, being the best, or beating their competition, based on what? Based upon what agreed upon metrics, timeframes, or objectives. And this is a problem because when we play with a finite mindset in an infinite game, when we play to win in a game that has no finish line, there's some consistent and predictable outcomes. The big ones are the decline of trust, the decline of cooperation, and the decline of innovation. So now let tr let's translate that to a policing organization, right? An infinite game is not the absence of finite games. It is the context within which finite games exist. Clearly, you are engaged in finite things every day of your career. You have a project that you need to complete. There's a beginning, middle, and end. If someone has committed a crime, you want to try and catch that person. There is a known objective. There's a beginning, middle, and end. There's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser. Right? If somebody, uh, you're chasing somebody down for, for a moving violation, for example, there, this is, these things are finite. But Policing and the organization of the Orange County Sheriff is an infinite organization. We hope that this organization outlasts everybody here and thrives beyond everybody here. So the decisions we make and the way we conduct ourselves have to be considerate of the fact that we want this organization to thrive for the long term. Any participant in any industry can get lazy when there is little change in how that industry operates. And then when there's a sudden change to how the industry operates, Everybody gets angry, panics, and points a finger. <laughs> I'll give you an example, okay? I'll give you two examples. Example number one, taxi companies around the world hate Uber. 
right? Now, here's the reality. The app that calls a car, not proprietary. You can call a taxi with, a, with an app, right? Paying with your phone, not proprietary. Any taxi can do that as well. The reason Uber is eating taxi companies for lunch is because it's a better product. And the taxi companies around the world could have a shitty product because you're the only game in town and we had no choice. And now you have a competitor and instead of competing, you're getting angry. I would gladly take more cabs than call services if I got in the cab and he said hi and it was clean and I had a nice chat with him and he wasn't on the phone and he wasn't smoking and all of these things and I had some leg room. I'd glad, gladly, gladly, it has nothing to do with the app, the pay mechanism, it has to do with the fact that Juno and Lyft are just better. It's just a better experience, better product. That's why I take them. It costs a dollar more. Whatever, I'll pay for it. It's not even a price thing. I have no idea if it's cheaper or more expensive. I actually have never compared. <laughs> the same goes for Starbucks, right? So there was a, a lot of people hate Starbucks because they put mom and pops out of business, right? The reality is the complete opposite that when Starbucks moves into a neighborhood, mom and pop's coffee shops actually do better for two reasons. One, Starbucks attracts more customers, so there's just more people. And the second reason is there is a groundswell of giving back to the local, and so more people go to the mom and pop, right? The ones that go out of business are the ones that refuse to compete. I'll give you a real life example. This goes back a few years. A real life example, I'm lactose intolerant, right? So I don't have milk in my coffee. And there was a time where it wasn't a foregone conclusion that every coffee shop had soy milk or almond milk or something. So I would always go into the mom and pop that was across the street from Starbucks, always go into the mom and pop, and I'd say, do you guys have any soy milk? And they'd go, nope. I'd go like, thank you, and I would walk out. Those went out of business because I went to Starbucks. He's right, I went to Starbucks. Now, had Starbucks moved in and they went across the street and said, let's see what Starbucks has, we should offer soy milk. Maybe it's time for us to replace this ripped couch that we've had for 15 years because it's really nice across there and it's really gross here. It's the ones who got angry and refused to compete that went out of business. I think retail's the same. Everybody's pointing fingers instead of saying, we've had it really good for a bunch of years. And the question is now, what is our competitor revealing about our own weaknesses that we can learn to improve? Because that's what competition does. Competition reveals your weaknesses to you. And when you had no competition, you didn't know where you were weak. This is the problem with being the best at anything. Uh, because you don't know where your, your faults are and then somebody undermines you because they can see your faults before you can. No one is, no one is born with self-confidence. Zero. Right? Every single one of us, our self-confidence was determined by how we were raised, the parents we had, the teachers we had, the bosses we've had, the jobs we've had. M my sister worked for a company for 17 years and her boss destroyed her self-confidence. She came out of that job and she didn't realize until she got into her new job how afraid she was to make decisions because of her boss. And it took, it took a while for her to get her confidence back. Um, and so if somebody's insecure, we have to over and over and over again prove to them because we don't know where they came from. We don't know what kind of trouble they got in before for being honest, right? Or what, how they were raised, we don't know. And so we have to total empathy and just prove to them that, that if they make a mistake, they're gonna get helped, not hurt. They're gonna get supported, not yelled at. And it, the first time they won't believe you, they think it's a game, they think it's a con, it's a trick. The second time, Maybe, and we just have to keep at it. That every time, I used, to have, I used to have somebody on my team who would regularly lie to me, right? Because she would rather lie to me than tell me that she made a mistake. It was, in, and I could, and if I saw the lie, I would ask so many questions to get her to say to me, I screwed up. I'd be like, well, this doesn't make sense. Because I can't say you're lying to me, right? I'd just say, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense. If this adds up to this, then why is it that? And she would, she, the lie would get bigger, and, and then she would yell at me, about how I don't trust her. And then at the end, I have to be like, listen, it clearly doesn't add up. I'm okay if it doesn't add up if you made a mistake. Just tell me, and I'm good, and we'll move on. Mm. But when you deceive me, I'm gonna ask you so many questions to get to the truth 
that it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. I had to have that conversation with her uh, probably 50 times before little cracks started to show where she showed up to me once where one number wasn't there and she looked at me and said, I made a mistake. And I went, cool, thanks. Well, Alan Mullaly puts it brilliantly. He says, you, you have a problem, you are not the problem. Right? So if something goes wrong, we have a problem, but you are not the problem. And that's the, pr the point is we've too many times told people that they're the problem. So I think it's just gonna take time and patience and you have to do the hard work of helping that person build up their confidence again. Human beings, we can't help ourselves but compare ourselves to others. And uh, comparison is, is the deadliest thing we can do to ourselves because we will always come up short. I mean, right. it'll, it'll, all it does is exaggerate all of our insecurities. Um, it's okay to enjoy other people's success, but you, let them live their lives and mm -hmm. you live your life. Oh, and by the way, they're curating their social media. That's not really their life. <laughs> Um, and so you're making decisions based on how you feel, based on their curated p things. I know, I've talked to so many millennials, I know somebody who's out of work, really depressed, and yet she goes and does all these things so she has the appearance of this amazing successful life. And, and so you might, now she may be making those decisions based on what her friends, who knows what sort of weird, twisted, exaggerated, you know, circle of, of, of depression this is forming. Mm -hmm. So go back to the rules of the infinite game. Your friends are there to admire. Your friends are there to say, God, that I'm so happy for them. What are they doing that I can learn from? I'll give you an example. So, we're all, so we can all fall into this trap. So you know, in my business, uh, authors and speakers and folks like us, we're all comparing ourselves to each other and sometimes it can get silly and competitive. And there was, you know, sometimes I go on Amazon and I check the rankings of my books to see that, there's, <laughs> that I still have a job. And, and now and then there was this one author mm -hmm. who I hated for no reason. <laughs> He's very smart, his work's incredibly good. He's incredibly well respected. I respect him, but I hate him. And I would check the rankings of his books. And when I was ahead, I'd be like, yes. <laughs> and when he was ahead, I was like, <laughs> right? it would drive me crazy. And I had this weird abstract competition. Mm -hmm. Same thing, right? Social media happened to be Amazon rankings. Right. And I would check in all the time. I'd always check in, mine, his, mine, his, nobody else, just mine and his. <laughs> Anyway, we were, uh, I, sh I was at an event and we were interviewed together on the same stage. Mm -hmm. And the interviewer decided to let us in introduce each other. <laughs> so I went first. <laughs> I had to introduce him. And this is what I said. I looked at him and I said, uh, you make me very insecure. <laughs> I said, uh, because all of your strengths are all of my weaknesses. And every time I see you do well, it just reminds me what I'm bad at. That's how I opened up. He, he turned to me and he said, funny, I feel the same way about you. <laughs> and now we love each other. <laughs> because I realized that he's really good at what I'm bad at, so by me getting to know him and really learning to love him, I'm realizing I'm getting better at those things. And I'm taking more pride in the things that I'm good at rather, think, rather than thinking I have to be good at everything he's good at, right? So that, that it's, it's healthy to grow our own strengths and mm -hmm. rather than be intimidated by the strengths of others. The human brain cannot comprehend the negative. It is incapable. Yes, it's true. I'll give you an example. Okay, no, no, I'll give you an example. You don't have to believe me. I'll prove it. I'll prove it. Okay, the human brain cannot comprehend the negative. You ready? Don't think of an elephant. Oh. Yeah, I know. You can't, you can't tell the human brain not to do something, right? And so what happens is we very often reinforce things when we put things in the negative, right? I can't get apart. I can't get apart. I can't get apart, right? Or um, um, I can't do this versus I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna keep doing this, right? Um, and and it's, it's such a huge thing to, to convert things into the affirmative. You're supposed to do it with children as well. We're supposed to say, we're, instead of saying to children, don't eat on the couch, we're supposed to say, eat at the table. 
right? We tell people what we want them to do, not what, them, what we don't want to do. Pilots know this, right? It is well known in the pilot community that when you tell a pilot don't hit the obstacle, they'll hit the obstacle. Because what they're doing is focusing on the obstacle. Skiers know this. If, if you ever seen skiers go through trees, do you know how they do that? It's very easy. It's actually surprisingly easy. If you go through trees on skis and you go, don't hit a tree, don't hit a tree, don't hit a tree, guess what you're watching? You're only looking at trees. All you're doing is seeing trees. You don't understand how anyone can ski with all these trees, right? As opposed to follow the snow, follow the path, follow the path. The only thing you see is the path. Skiers know this. If you say don't hit a tree, you'll hit a tree. You won't be able to find a path because all you see is millions of trees. If you say only follow the path, you actually don't see any trees. There's actually very sparse trees. There's plenty of path, there's plenty of snow. It's the same thing for you. If you focus on the obstacles, all you will see is obstacles. If you focus on the path through the trees, all you will see is path through the trees. It's your choice how you choose to perceive your own career. It's literally perspective. Can you, off the top of your head, can you think of, you talked, you compared you know, the finite mindset to some things with law enforcement. Sure. As far as infinite, can you think of anything off the top of your head where you could relate that specifically to what we do and what that might look like? Anybody who's wearing a uniform here knows this because you've had this experience in your career, right? Which is treating someone with dignity. That's right. Treating someone with dignity has nothing to do whether they are guilty or innocent, right? Yeah. Um, that everybody here knows that when you treat somebody with dignity, the way they respond to you, even if they've committed a crime and they're sitting there in handcuffs, is very, very different than when we don't treat them with dignity. So for example, treating someone with dignity may look like um, somebody gets pulled over for expired tags or something and you've, they've got a warrant, I don't know, and you have to tow their car, right? So you call a tow truck and now somebody who's maybe financially struggling, you've just put at least $300 more that they have to deal with. Or treating them with dignity is like, hey, I, I, gotta, I gotta tow your car. Before I call a tow truck, do you wanna call somebody, you wanna call a family member or something who can come here and get your car? Um, that'll save you 300 bucks, you know, and, and help you out, you know? And if you can't call somebody, I'm gonna have to tow it, right? That's treating someone with dignity. And everybody here knows that when you treat somebody with dignity, sometimes you're taking them to jail and they thank you. And the way in which people respond to the uniform if treated with dignity has nothing to do with breaking the law or being put in handcuffs. It's, how to, it's, it's, it's human being to human being. And so I think in a, in a law enforcement, uh, when law enforcement is conducted in a policing organization, you're thinking about the longevity of the value of the uniform. You're thinking about the relationship of, of the, the, those who wear the uniform in, in public, how much the public is willing to help us if a crime is committed, and we go out to the public and say, can you help us, and their willingness. Those, those things are determined right now on a day-to-day -day basis, right? It, and you, you asked before about building of trust, right? Trust does, there's no big thing you can do that builds trust. Trust is built up with lots and lots and lots of tiny little innocuous little things. Think of it like a, your own relationship. Like, you know, have you ever been in love? The person who fell in love with you, there wasn't like, I, I bought you flowers on Valentine's Day, now you love me, right? That's not how it works. It's like, you know, I went to the fridge to get myself a drink and I got you one too without you asking. I woke up in the morning and I said good morning to you before I checked my phone. There was a game on and you said, honey, can I talk to you? And I paused the game and said, what's on your mind? Right? I'm being idealistic. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, my point is, is no one of those things made someone fall in love or, or trust you, but it's the combination and accumulation of all those tiny little individually innocuous things that we say, I believe you and I trust you. Now imagine an entire organization where we're just trying to do our job, we just have to enforce the law, we just have to do these things, these are the rules, this is how we do it, but the manner in which we conduct ourselves, each one innocuous unto itself, over the course of time, builds tremendous trust with an organization and the community so that when you need to pull from that trust bank, when you need to make a, make a, make a withdrawal, That's it. right? Because <laughs> something's gone really horribly wrong and maybe there was somebody who acted illegally within the department that you get to say to the community, we screwed up and I need your help to be patient. They go, you're good, you're good. That's but that, that trust is earned. I think courage is external, right? The reason someone has courage to jump out of an airplane is because there's a parachute on their back. It's the external thing. Uh, 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 a world-famous trapeze artist 
would never try a brand new death-defying act for the first time without a net. It's the net that gives them the courage. Uh, you know, the Navy SEALs are considered one of the highest performing organizations on the planet. And a former SEAL was asked, what kind of person makes it into the SEALs? And he said, I can't tell you the kind of person that makes it in, but I can tell you the kind of person that doesn't make it in. He said the star college athletes who have never really been tested to the core of their being, none of them make it in. He said the preening leaders who like to delegate everything, none of them make it in. He says the guys who show up with hulking muscles covered in tattoos because they want to show you how tough they are, none of them make it in. He said, he said some of the guys who make it in are skinny and scrawny. He said some of the guys who make it in, you see them shivering out of fear. He said, but every single one of the guys who makes it in, when they're emotionally exhausted, when they're physically exhausted, when they have absolutely nothing left to give, somehow, some way, they're able to dig down deep inside themselves to find the energy to help the guy next to them. In other words, the reason these organizations and these people have the courage to do remarkable things is not because of their internal strength. It's because they have the absolute confidence that there is someone to the left of them and someone to the right of them that cares about them. Um, and they all know that. And it's the quality of the relationships that we maintain, professionally and personally, that give us the courage to do difficult things. Uh, Isaac Stern, the famous violinist, said, music is what happens between the notes. Well, something like trust happens between the meetings. You know, we, few people think about the importance of building trust when they go to work. Or the, what do I need to do today to build trust with somebody? Like, that doesn't really go through people's minds. But we have chit-chat as we walk into the meeting. We have chit-chat when we walk out of the meeting. And we see somebody in the hall and they're like, oh, meant to tell you something. Or you knock on someone's door and be like, got a minute? And all those little innocuous interactions over the course of time, like any relationship, build trust. Uh, it's about setting up the computer, setting up Zoom and having a work session with somebody. You know, like we're not working on the same thing, but I want to work with somebody, a work buddy, or having a, a lunch with somebody over Zoom, or a Monday morning huddle where we talk about what's on our heart and minds, but we do not talk business on purpose, or Friday uh, cocktails that are just voluntary. But the most important one is to just pick up the phone and call people and say, how are you? That level of empathy. Just check in on someone. And I think we neglect it because we get mired in the day-to-day. -day. But, you know, one of, you know, if you're organized or disorganized, you know, literally keep a list of your team on a little card next to your computer and just, you know, go through it. And have I called this person in a while and talked to this person? I'm just going to call and check in. It doesn't matter if something's wrong or not wrong. Just check in on them. You know, don't wait for something to break. Um, and let people know that, they're, uh, that there's connection and there's a way to reach out and say, I need help. Um, because if, 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 and, and the most important thing is for leaders to be honest and open about their need to ask for help. And that, that'll work. They happen to have a coffee bar uh, in the lobby of the Four Seasons in Vegas. And so one afternoon, I went and bought myself a cup of coffee, and uh, the barista working that day was a kid named Noah. Noah was funny and charming and engaging, and I spent far too long buying a cup of coffee because I just so enjoyed talking to Noah. So as is my uh, nature, I asked Noah, um, do you like your job? And without skipping a beat, Noah said, I love my job. Now in my line of work, that's significant. Like is rational. I like the people, I like the, I like the work, you know, I, I get paid well, I like my job. Love is emotional, it's a higher order connection, right? Like, do you love your wife? I like her a lot, right? <laughs> clearly, <laughs> it's clearly a different standard. Right? Uh, yeah. So when Noah said, I love my job, my ears perked up. This kid has an emotional connection to his work. So immediately I followed up and said, tell me specifically what the Four Seasons is doing that you would say to me, you love your job. And again, without skipping a beat, Noah said, throughout the day, managers will walk past me and ask me how I'm doing, ask me if there's anything that I need to do my job better, not just my manager, any manager. And then he said, I also work at another hotel. And there the managers walk past us and catch us when we do something wrong. There the managers are always trying to drive performance and make sure we hit our numbers. He said, there I'd like to keep my head below the radar, get through the day and just collect my paycheck. Only at the Four Seasons do I feel I can be myself. Now, this is the exact same human being 
working at two different companies, and yet our experience of him will be profoundly different, not because of him, but because of the leadership environment in which he works. You know, I get this question all the time. You know, Simon, how do we get the most out of our people? People are not a towel that you wring them out to see how much you can get out of them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, yeah. it's. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, man. <laughs> it's a flawed question. The question is, how do we create an environment on, in which our people can work at, at their natural best? And that is the art of leadership. It's creating environment in, in which relationships can thrive, in which trust can thrive, and we all know what it feels like to be on a trusting team, right? Um, it means that we feel psychologically safe enough to raise our hand and say, um, I made a mistake, or I need help, or I'm having trouble at home and it's affecting my work, or I'm scared, or I don't know what to do. Um, without any fear of humiliation or retribution, but rather to say these things with the absolute confidence that someone on our team will rush to support us. Unfortunately, we also all know what it feels like not to work on a trusting team, where admitting any of those things could hurt your chances of promotion, could hurt your chances of, it, it, you could be humiliated. Um, and so when we, when we work on teams where, where leadership is creating an environment where, there's, where trust is a, a, at a premium, um, we force our people to come to work and, and lie, hide, and fake, where they're pretending that they've made no mistakes, they're lying, hiding, and faking, and eventually things will crack and things will eventually break. And, and when you talk about reinvention and you talk about innovation and you talk about challenging the status quo or whatever it is, necessarily there's risk and necessarily there are mistakes and necessarily there's stupid ideas. And you have to create an environment in which that's good. The alternative is everybody playing it safe which is not the way that leads to, to, to vast or significant improvement. There's no such thing as a perfect job and there's no such thing as a, a perfect person. Of course there are things that we are doing that hold ourselves back and of course there are things about the environment in which we work, whether it's the people or the job or the, wh whatever the circumstances that may also be holding us back. I mean, but to see ourselves as victims is not, is not, the, op is not the thing, mm -hmm. um, but rather to seek opportunity and, and it goes back to that growth mindset, um, uh, which is, it's, what I've learned is one of the best ways to grow oneself is to actually help somebody on the team grow. Um, service. You know, there's an entire section in the bookshop called self-help, and there's no section in the bookshop called help others. And I think what we've done is we've over-indexed on the whole rugged individualism sort of self-helpy thing. How can I be successful? How can I grow my business? How can I lose weight? How can I find love? And yet we forget how can I help somebody else grow their business? How can I help somebody else find success? How can I help, help somebody else lose weight and find love, etc.? And the irony is, is the more that we set out to help somebody else because we have more objectivity with other people, ironically, we actually learn to help ourselves. I, I, I tried this out, I did a little experiment. Um, a, a dear friend of mine uh, was going through a, a, hard, a hard time, um, a, a solopreneur, um, work wasn't going well, uh, her marriage was shaky, and she was in a bad place. And so she knows what I do for a living, so she called me up and says, would you spend some time with me? I said, of course. So every single week, religiously, we spent about 90 minutes together. And she'd come over and we would talk, and I would offer her some perspective and some ideas, and she'd feel great for like a day or two, and then she'd go back. And then we'd get together the next week, and she'd feel great for a couple of days, and then go back. And this repeating pattern went on for quite a while. And then I remembered, my own work, which is the idea of service, um, and had a little idea, which is to switch, to switch it around. And I called her up and said, look, I would like some coaching too, and it was genuine. I said, you know me better than anybody else, I trust you completely. When we get together um, for one of our sessions, can, it, can, I, can I use up some of the time? Can I tell you what I'm going through? And what ended up happening is we spent all 90 minutes talking about my stuff. And this went week after week after week, where she was just the uh, uh, advice giver. And strange things started to happen. She started to get more stability in her work, more stability in her marriage. Her confidence went up. And it was because she was helping me. 
that she was gaining all the insights and perspective because it wasn't personalized. It's like sales training, and anybody who's ever gone through sales training, you know this, which is you always do it with three people. You know, the person who plays the role of the salesperson, the person who plays the role of the, uh, the person you're selling to, the buyer, and, and an observer. And it's the observer that does the learning, not the people playing the roles. Well, in this case, you got to see herself not be, in, not be uh, so close to it. It gave her objectivity. So I'm a great believer in if you have a problem to solve at work, try and help somebody else solve that same problem. I was, uh, during COVID, um, I worked out with a friend of mine who lives somewhere else. And we worked out on FaceTime together. We would just turn on FaceTime and just do the same workout together, basically. And one day we were doing a particularly difficult workout. And I said to her, I have some good news and I have some bad news. She says, well, what's the bad news? I said, the bad news is we're only halfway done. She says, well, what's the good news? She, I said, the good news is we're already halfway done. And that simple, the simple way in which I present the information literally profoundly changes the way in which we do the second half of the, the workout. We're only halfway done. The rest of the, the, the workout's a slog. It's difficult. It's hard. And we don't want to do it. We're already halfway done. I mean, it's all downhill. We've already done this once. We can easily finish this off. And it's amazing how easy it is to change our mindset. Um, uh, uh, and so it's the same thing here. Um, we've done it in our own organization where, um, we see another organization who, you know, I mean, I hate to use the word, I use it just for the, for the example, but outpaces us. I mean, we don't care about that, but, and, and instead of getting all angry and hot and bothered and trying to beat them, we say to them, we're the rival. What, what, you know, what strength do they have that's revealing a weakness in us? And we're like, oh my goodness, our website sucks or our e-commerce sucks or our you know, customer service sucks, or whatever it is. You know, we spend a lot of time looking at people who we admire, who are in our space, who do some or many things better than us. We're like, look at their websites. We look at their product. We look at their ease of use. We're like, wow, that's really good. You know, we don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with it, but we can still compliment it. Um, and I think that's the big thing. People think that, you know, that you, you know, uh, that, that you have to hate everything that somebody does. Nonsense. You don't have to agree or like, but you do have to respect. Um, and, uh, and quite frankly, to put on blinders and go through the world with blinders on that there's no one else out there and they definitely can't do anything better than you is quite frankly just stupid because it's just not true. Um, you're not great at everything and you never will be. It's an infinite game. It's a game of constant improvement, just like every person. There's no such thing as a perfect person. You know, we should be in a growth mindset, constantly trying to improve every day of our lives. It's the same thing. And it's even that's difficult. Even that's you, even that you can't, you can't grow every day. Even that's hard, you know, it's messy and human and that's the fun. And that's why you go back to trusting teams and why the teamwork matters so much, because sometimes we can beat up ourselves or get stuck in a negative mindset. And all you need is one person to walk up and be like, Hey, worthy rival. Right? So the nice thing about worthy rivals is it's subjective. You can choose whichever person, whichever company you want. You don't want to have internal competition, but you can have internal, internal rivals you know, where there are other people that you compare yourselves to and you try and get better, um, uh, but you don't want to stab each other in the back, get angry when somebody else gets a promotion. Like we've all had that. We've all had that, you know, deep down inside, we seethe when somebody gets a promotion when we didn't, right? Um, oh, even if we weren't even up for it. Um, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a sign where, where necessary change needs to happen uh, in our mindset. Uh, it's easier to do than you think. And when you get in the habit of it, it's absolutely wonderful tell someone I need help. Like, I think it is one of us. It's one of these skills that is becoming fast lost, especially amongst a younger generation, which is the skill to ask for help. You know, we're all trying to act so tough. You know, this, this nation over indexed on the whole rugged individualism thing, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. where we define success as individual success. Um, and, and most of our metrics, most of our incentives and almost every job are individual incentives there, you know, there's no team bonus. There's an individual bonus. If you hit your numbers, you know? Um, and, uh, I think we've, we've overdid it quite frankly. Uh, and I think it's the pendulum needs to come back. Uh, and, and, and we have to remember that we're a team. We're members of teams. We're members of families. We're members of communities. We're members of societies. And this is where Maslow got it wrong. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He says, you know, fundamentally at the bottom of the pyramid is food and shelter. Um, and he put, you know, third, you know, third up the rung, he put uh, 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 relationships. Well, I've never heard of anyone dying no. by suicide because they were hungry. I've heard of people dying by suicide because they were lonely. So in other words, it can't be right. And at the top, you have self-actualization. How, oh, like I'm all self-actualized looking down at the rest of you who aren't at the top of the pyramid. What about shared actualization? <laughs> you know, and the mistake he made 
is that there's a paradox, which is every moment of every day, we are both individuals and members of groups. And every day we have to reconcile that. Do I put myself first at the expense of someone else or do I prioritize someone else at the expense of myself? And the answer is you're right and you're wrong. And there's a whole group of people that says, no, no, you always take care of yourself first because if you're not healthy, you can't help others. And there's another group of people that says, no, you always help others first because unless you help them, they won't be there for you. It's a paradox. It doesn't work. It's not so clean. Um, and this is what we have to reconcile every day. Um, and this is why finding balance and managing it and the stresses and trains, but the, the, the challenge of asking for help and relying on our community really, really matters. My, my, my definition of faith is that knowing you're on a team, even when you don't know who all the players are. Um, there, oh, we, are we are surrounded by people who love us and will take care of us. You just have to ask sometimes because sometimes they don't know that we need it. We, like many, um, mo made most of our money from in-person and live events and workshops. And of course, that instantaneously disappeared. Um, and so we, like many, were forced to pivot. Um, uh, and we took advantage of online learning. But we wanted to do it consistent with our own values. Um, um, we did live classes um, because we wanted to retain some sort of human connection as opposed to just on-demand classes. Um, we called up people who we knew, who work, whose work we admired, and we said, you're struggling too. Why don't you come and do, share your, your genius on our platform? Um, and it became a very cooperative thing. But there's a few tactics that I learned um, to get from A to B that were really helpful that I never would have done if I didn't have that extreme pressure. So one of the things we did is we, we shared with the team the vision, um, which we had, um, and then we said to the whole team, uh, we can't do this alone. This is, this is literally a team effort. And so what I want is I want 15 ideas from each person in the next 48 hours about how we can deliver on that vision. And the team freaked out. 15 ideas in 48 hours? And if they wanted to work in teams, I was fine with that. Um, and, I, and, and the reason for that is um, the pressure, you know, if I gave them three weeks, well, they would have all done the work the 48 hours before anyway. So, you know, uh, 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 so that was academic. But the important thing was the reason for 15 ideas is because if I only asked for two or three or three or four, those would be the same ideas I came up with. Um, uh, and I wanted, it's the idea that 11, 12, and 13 that were the brilliant ones. And when we came together to report out, we did it in sort of a unique way. I sort of gave this little speech where I said, okay, um, uh, this is not a competition. This is about contribution. If one person has six amazing ideas and you have none, instead of being angry, say thank you, because they just saved your job because they had a great idea. Also, what I learned is that there's a, there's a difference between somebody who has an idea and someone who's good at executing an idea. And the reality is the most creative people in the team that could come up with the ideas weren't the best at executing them. And the ones that didn't have that many ideas, they were great at executing ideas. So it became really interesting to see who were my creators and who were my executors from that one meeting. And we played boggle rules. If you ever played the game boggle, if somebody else has your word, you just skip over it and move on. I said, if somebody says your idea, don't bother saying, well, I had that idea too. I'm not keeping score, I don't care. Simply move on and tell me something else on your list. And we only let people re report out two or three ideas at a time. That way we could sort of get a, a flavor. And what ended up happening was people would build on the ideas that they heard. And the set of ideas that we had at the end became our ideas. Nobody could claim them anymore because we'd all sort of tinkered with them. And then we broke them into three buckets, green, yellow, and red. A green idea was an idea we could execute with the money we had and we could execute it within the week. A yellow idea was an idea that needed a little more resource, probably take a week to a month. And a red idea, no matter how good it was, was too expensive or take too long. And we just parked it and said, we'll deal with those one day. And we just took all our green ideas and executed them. There are so many lessons that we've learned over the past year and a half to two years that I think prepare us to be ready for the next future. Um, I got a kick out of during the height of COVID, uh, the number of pundits who said during these unpredictable times, I would smile and say, all times are unpredictable. There's never been a time that was predictable ever. Um, all that happened was something that uh, we didn't expect happened that reminded us that our lives and our work is unpredictable. And to future-proof ourselves means being ready for the unpredictable. 
um, there's something called an infinite mindset. And those with an infinite mindset embrace surprise. Uh, they find opportunity in the unexpected. That when something goes haywire, they go, ooh, what could we do with this? Versus a finite mindset, which likes to exert control and keep things very, very close and time frame short because they fear the uncertain. They fear anything that's off the plan. And one of the things that we have to do to, pr to future proof, proof ourselves is to embrace things that are surprises and embrace the opportunity in uncertainty. The other thing that I think we have to learn on how to future proof ourselves is how to deal with stress and how to deal with trauma. Um, uh, whether somebody uh, did well during COVID uh, uh, business wise or whether they struggled business wise, all of us, all of us suffered some sort of trauma. Uh, and when I, when COVID first showed up, I called a friend of mine who's active duty military and I asked him during, when you're in combat, what do you do to compartmentalize your emotions so you can stay mission focused? My business blew up in, right in front of me and I had to focus on my mission of rebuilding my business. I wanted to know how to control my emotions so I could get the work done that I had to get done. And he gave me a very sobering warning. He said, no one can compartmentalize their emotions. He says, we can do it for a short period of time, but everyone will suffer the trauma of combat, sometimes many months after we get home. And he said, you will go through it. Maybe not now, but you will go through it. And uh, sure, sure enough, about four or five months in, um, I started to feel extremely off my game. Um, and uh, I called him up and I said, can I just ask you, you know, uh, what are your symptoms when you go through the, 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 the trauma of, of combat? I asked no leading questions. I simply said, what are your symptoms? He said, well, one, I fall out of my sleep pattern. For some reason, I go to bed late for no reason, and I don't want to get up in the morning. And I thought to myself, yep. And he said, I become unproductive, and I rationalize it. Like, oh, you've been working hard. It's okay if you have an unproductive day or two. But then I have another and another and another. And I thought to myself, yep. And he said, I also become extremely antisocial. I don't want to talk to anyone. I definitely don't want to ask for help. Uh, and I thought to myself, yup. And I realized I was going through depression. I was afraid to use that word for fear that it sounded like a diagnosis, but it was little d depression. That's exactly what I was going through, which is why things weren't working. And so I asked my friend again, so how do you overcome it? He said, one, you have to force yourself to get back into your sleep pattern. And two, you have to force yourself to ask people for help. And that's exactly what I was doing. And I reached out to friends that I trusted, friends that I loved people who I knew were dispensers of good advice. And I called them one by one and said, I'm going through this. What can I do? I also reached out to friends who I knew were going through similar things and offered my support for them because that's one of the things I've learned in my career, which is the best way to solve your problems is to help people who are going through the same thing. And so to understand how to react under extreme stress, to understand um, and build the relationship so that when you do go through something, you know who to call. My rule during COVID, and I called all my A-type personality friends and gave them my rule, which is there's no crying alone. And the question I would ask every one of you is, if you start to cry, who are you going to call? Who will you pick up the phone and just say, I need to cry and tell them what's going on? Uh, it is much healthier to know that someone will give you a shoulder and be there to support you no matter what you're going through. There are many people in your industry who talk a good game. They talk about relationships, mm -hmm. but let's be honest, it's bullshit. Mm -hmm. They just want to make the transaction and move on. And uh, they pretend that they care and they pretend it's, you know, that, that they care about the relationship when the reality is it's one and done and on to the next. And that's what happened to me. I, I had a mortgage broker. Uh, he sold me a mortgage. He was recommended to me. That's how most of us meet somebody, you know. Uh, and uh, he was very nice and charming and, and was there with me. And then my, my, my sale went through and he called me up to congratulate me, and I was feeling all warm and fuzzy towards him, and then as soon as he congratulated me, he said, and if you can recommend me to anybody else, I'd be really grateful. Like, and I, he wasn't calling to congratulate me. He was calling to remind me to put in a good word for him somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Like, if he actually cared about me and my house, then he would have just called me really excited that I got my house, yeah. and if he wanted something from me, he would have waited a week or, a week or two to ask the favor. But the guy, it became abundantly clear to me, I'm in the human behavior business. Yes. He never called me because he cared about me. Yeah. And by the way, I will never, ever recommend him because it was never, I realized that I was just a number on a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. 
And so if you actually care about building relationships, then actually build relationships. Yeah. You know, um, I remember when I was starting out in my career, I had a young, mar uh, a, 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 a little marketing consultancy, and I came from an industry that pretended that they were good at everything, the marketing world, like literally, they pretended they were good at everything, whether they were or weren't. And when I went off by myself, it was important to me to be honest. And clients would come and talk to me and say, we want to hire you to do all these things. And I'd say, I'll do that when I'm really good at that, pretty good at that. I like doing that. That I'm mediocre on, that I suck at. I highly recommend you hire another company to do that and I'm happy to par partner with them. And it made them want to do business with me more. Because you said no. Because I told them what I was good at and what yeah. I was bad at, where I was super honest. Yeah. And we've all had that experience where you want to hire somebody and they go, you should, let me introduce you to somebody. It happened to me recently. Yeah. I wanted a, is it like something silly? Yeah. You know, I needed wallpaper. Yeah. I, I, he highly recommended, I called him up, he came, he gave me a quote. He's like, you know what, I'm not the best at this thing. Yeah. And he gave me the number of somebody else. Yeah. Now all I want to do is work with him again. Yeah. And I keep giving out yeah. his phone number yeah. to other people even though I actually never did work with him. Because yeah. what builds a relationship is an honest broker. Mm -hmm. Honesty is such a hard thing to get especially in a transaction business, especially in a commodity business, because mm -hmm. it is just volume and numbers. Yeah. And that when you actually find an honest one, all you want to do is help them build their book of business, mm -hmm. even though you may never do business with them. And that's what a lot of finite-minded folks in your business don't get, yeah. which is you may never sell me a mortgage, but I'll become your biggest champion. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For some incredible Alex Hormozzi motivation, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. They just keep going. And so to the same degree, you probably do things every single day that you should not be doing. And so what I want to introduce to you is a concept of the anti-routine as the most productive routine that is humanly possible for you.